Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to the second ISTAKOF 2020. Before commencing to the third plenary session, on behalf of CTSS, we would like to announce the launching of SI Contest 2021 with the theme of preserving and strengthening local knowledge for community resilience. The SI Contest is aimed to document the link of Indonesian local knowledge with its contribution to sustainable development. The SI Contest is open for Indonesian undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate students. For more information, please refer to CTSS website, ctss.ipb.ac.id. We would also like to remind the participants that you may ask questions via the quick Q&A section. For panelists, please use the chat section to ask your question. And for participants who have not filled in the attendance form, you can open the link shared in the chat section. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now coming to the third plenary session with the theme of shifting to complexity paradigm. The session will be led by Dr. Yulia Sugandi. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce our moderator before we proceed to the third plenary session. Dr. Yulia Sugandi is a fellow of CTSS IPB University. She received her doctoral degree in anthropology and sociology from the University of Münster. She is also the UNDP Accelerator, Accelerator Labs current head of solutions mapping and also a lecturer in the Faculty of Human Ecology, IPB University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Yulia Sugandi to lead the plenary session. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Yulia. This would like to correct a bit. Welcome, I, Dr. Yulia Sugandi. Thank you. I was a senior fellow for IPB, uh, FEMA IPB until last uh, year. So this is think it's it said you mute, you mute your uh, Zoom. I'm sorry, we yeah. can't hear you, Dr. Yulia Sugandi. Yeah, but I already unmute. Hello. Yeah. I can hear Yulia. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, yeah, Dr. Yulia Sugandi. I think we cannot hear you. Yeah, but can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Isabu. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, Ibu Yulia, saya bisa dengar. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to uh, revise a bit because I was a senior fellow and I was also a lecturer at IPB University until the end of uh, last year because it said it's still currently now. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me introduce. Uh, let me introduce our first panelist, uh, Ibu Mirza. But before introducing Ibu Mirza. First, I would like to, Ibu Mirza, let me uh, summarize or, or recap our sessions in, in this, mo this morning. So we've seen so many like inside, uh, I've, I've gained so many insights from uh, morning sessions, talking about the complexity from different kind of various, uh, various angles. Uh, we've heard the foundational philosophical basis of the importance of integrated paradigm through transdisciplinarity explained by Ibu Saras. We heard also practices from grassroots innovators like uh, Pasinggi, who's also practicing uh, business uh, men, but also uh, like uh, from uh, explanations from uh, Ibu uh, Ibu Dami has like really a lot of compassions, not only for himself but also environment, and that he has that in his mind in doing business. So he's very much a conscious and engaged businessman. We heard also uh, sharing experience from Ibu Maria it's about embeddedness in the local context, how he all sees also actively building like food security based on the local practices and values. We heard also from uh, uh, Ibu uh, Ibu Lasmi, yeah? Ibu Lasmi about the important not only uh, values and at the basis of the values constructions, but also in terms of political uh, systems 
and political structures. Okay, that's uh, that's what we heard so much uh, so, so far from the morning sessions. Now we enter into this afternoon sessions. Further about the complexity, still about moving forward to the complexity paradigm in afternoon sessions. My first speaker, our first speaker is Ibu Mirza. Ibu Mirza, Ibu Mirza got, got a, a PhD by writing about uh, three species frog in Indonesia. So ethnozoologist, yeah, but, yeah? the importance of ethnozoologists in relation to the conservations. But Ibu Mirza also has a background in uh, uh, maritime, marine, uh, marine uh, and in this moment, Ibu Mirza also acts as editorial board in academic services, academic uh, journals, members of Herpetological Society Indonesia, and still also very much engaged as a lecturer on the Department of Forest Resources, Conservation and Ecotourism. Now, from uh, Ibu Mirsa, we will learn more about the intersectionality, intersectionality uh, of issues within the complexity paradigm. So Ibu Mirsa will explain to us about the biocultural diversity. Biocultural diversity is inter intersectionality between biological, cultural, and linguistic aspect, and how is this also interrelated between our relations, human relations with the nature, and also with the animals. Uh, most of the research so far uh, have been touched upon uh, ethnobotany, and this is very special because we, we, we will hear more about ethnozoologists, uh, ethnozoology from uh, Ibu Mirza, and Ibu Mirza will explain about our relations in animals, how it is represented uh, through our constructions, our perceptions, how we think about the myth and origins and narratives, and how this is also uh, play the roles, important roles, and how we perceive our relations with the animals, how it plays an important role in conservation. Now, Ibu Mirza, I'm uh, ready to listen and learn. The floor is yours, Bo. Thank you. May I share my screen? Yes, I will share. Thank you very much uh, for Ibu Yuliani, uh, Yulia, uh, Yulia for uh, uh, introducing uh, me and thank you very much uh, for the uh, conference uh, uh, because they invited me when Ibu Dami uh, actually uh, approached me uh, for this uh, conference and she asked me to give a, a talk about uh, biocultural diversity. Uh, I wasn't really sure whether I am uh, the right uh, person because uh, as many people probably know that I'm a really what they call the classic biologist. I'm, I'm really into the, the species. Uh, so I, I learned about the habitat or the species itself. Uh, but, but then the further I study, I, I realized that my classical approach is probably not really sufficient, especially when I try to look the impact of a human and uh, wildlife. And maybe we need to account how human and wildlife able to coexist over the years. So because I work as herpetologist, I then adjust the title of presentation, uh, focusing on the human and reptile uh, coexistence. So I am a herpetologist. Not many people know what is a herpetologist, but we study amphibians and uh, reptiles. And I mostly work on amphibians, which unfortunately they're lumped together with reptiles because, uh, you know, uh, in history, they are the group, even though there's uh, evolutionary not related, but they're group because they're just thing as ugly. But I'm not very biased. How could you think that this little frog is ugly? For me, it's very cute. And this is the story that I want to start with, uh, start with, with this frog called the Barbarula kalimantanensis. This is a very unique uh, frog. It's endemic from Kalimantan and uh, found in 1970s, uh, eight, uh, 
uh, by people and described by Joko Iskandar from ITB uh, that this is a, a new species or this described, uh, never been described before. But what you need with this frog is this frog doesn't have lungs. So how do they know it? So in 2007, uh, Joko Iskandar described the species along with his counterpart, David Bigford from National University of Singapore, went back to the area where uh, they said that Barbarula exists, the, the locality uh, of the type. For days, they tried to find it. They couldn't. And in the end, they finally find it. When they find it, uh, it is really in upstream rapid water. They have to uh, actually uh, have to snorkel to find it. And their lips turn to blue because it's so cold. Uh, and then they have the paper out of it. Uh, when they took it out, the, the frog is always died. They, they wonder why. And they brought it to the lab and you know, open it and everything. And they found out they have no lungs. Uh, of course, it's always died because this frog used the skin uh, to, uh, to breathe. So what remarkable is nobody really asks, how do they find it? I was really curious because I was thinking like, how could they find it? How do they know that they live in that upstream uh, uh, forest? Uh, do they do a transect, randomize things and everything? So. Fortunately, I, I met one of the uh, local uh, researcher, the the uh, the research assistant. I, I asked him, like, how do you find it? So I'm I'm expected that he said, like, okay, we'll do this transect, the standard things and everything. But no, what he said is like, you know what? For days we couldn't find it. So in the end, we have the pictures of the specimen. We brought it to the local people, and we. We saw uh, when the local people saw the the picture, and they say like, "Oh, that fish!" They they said it's a fish because there's always in the water. So they said like, "It's a fish, and you can find it a lot over there." So they went there, and they found it. And of course, it never went to print because when you see the paper. It only said like, despite multiple atoms to locate more individuals, only two uh, specimen of this problem known to science. It's never been found by uh, Joko before. And then he said like, but we were able to discover the two new population upstream of the type locality. But they didn't really say that how they found it because they were helped by local people uh, that, uh, uh, the the frogs uh, is there, so for for us at the time it's kind of like we don't really ask them. Because it's kind of like expected because we care mostly about the animal. When we we wrote papers, uh, we usually in the method section we just mention uh, the standard made method how we found it. Uh, it could be a transect. We could be we say like we do the visual encounter survey or we are putting traps in selected. Uh, location and we celebrate, you know, randomized method. You know, you're putting how you put the transects and and everything. Uh, so we never really put uh, in the method section that the the methodology is asking local people, which is in truth. There's many of us uh, uh, do it, and as years go by, it's come to my relation that when I study animal, especially in the middle of nowhere, if we, we say it so, there will always be someone. It's not really in the middle of someone. There's always local people who live there for generations. They they depend their livelihood on the surrounding forest, on the wetlands, peatland, savanna, or all the environments. They have resources from the surrounding ecosystem. They have intimate knowledge of what and where species are. And when I did my PhD actually, because I'm doing my uh, study on harvested frogs, I actually really depended on local people and the local harvester how to, to, to found the, the, the frogs. And they invented names uh, in their lang and language and they shared about uh, the, the, the animal that they, they found or the, the plants uh, in stories. So that's what we, I'm thinking uh about that in in the past 
few years then I always ask my students to conduct their research by asking local people. Uh, this picture is shown my, my students, Alma, who is doing research uh, early this year before uh, the COVID-19 restriction. Uh, she was doing research on the biodiversity of turtles in the watershed of Southern uh, Sumatra. So, and we think like what better ways to know by asking the, the uh, villagers. It's, it could be the fishermen or the, the woman who always uh, was in the river to, uh, to ask them what species that they encounter. Uh, so armed with the pictures of turtles known in Sumatra, she went and asked uh, a tourist question. It's not about what species they found, but also where do they usually found? When is the last time they, they found the species and what do they do when they found them or do they use any of the turtles for food or for anything? And based on this uh, uh, question, she has then been able to report the diversity of turtles in the southern watershed of Sumatra. Uh, what is, she got information, what is the species that is common and which species is concentrated uh, loss or uh, endangered. So this kind of uh, approach is actually starting to be more common among uh, biologists. Uh, before that, biologists tend to, to box our knowledge into separate system. Uh, we have become uh, familiar with the idea of biodiversity uh, as the biological variety of, uh, of life on earth. Uh, we, we learned about uh, diversity at the level of species, their habitats, uh, the ecosystem, and also uh, their genes. Uh, and in the meantime, we also learned that the greatest threat of uh, the biodiversity is human action. Uh, and yet society and, and culture and language has developed throughout human history. Uh, and the diversity of cultures people already uh, known is interrelated with and interdependent with biology system because people use uh, uh, the, the plants around them or the animal and they have adapted uh, with the life in the particular uh, environment and people are communities uh, or communities that live in uh, one area they need to acquire in that knowledge of what is available for them, what kind of species that they can harvest or eat, how is the ecological relationships, and how is the ecosystem function. And so they have to tailor their cultural practices to, to, to suit their uh, ecological needs. And what we know now uh, term as the traditional environment uh, knowledge, I think a lot of uh, social now uh, term is uh, STA AK or the traditional environment knowledge. And then it is shared uh, by the culture and passed through lang language and uh, custom. And this integration of this thing is known as the bio uh, biocultural uh, diversity. Uh, this is a, a, a concept, it's not really new actually, it's, I think it's already started in, in 2000. And however, it's a bit slow being integrated by biologists, uh, mostly people in the anthropology or social, they already think beyond that. But us as a biologist, we are kind, kind of like uh, slowly uh, develop understanding that uh, there's a, an integrated uh, and a complex system between only the animal or the plants, but also with the human that lives in there and also the language, how they, they uh, process it. Um, so, yeah, and this is a slide that I've taken from a paper, Loh and, and Harmon, and I think uh, in some of the books uh, about uh, bico uh, bicultural diversity, it's always mentioned how, uh, this map is actually overlay the geographic distribution of biodiversity and culture and linguistic uh, diversity worldwide. And as 
people in the biology are still already uh, aware of that Indonesia is one of the hotspots for the biodiversity in terms for uh, for the the flora and fauna, but also in culturally and linguistic we really also have a high uh, uh, diversity and it shows that there's a significant overlap between uh, the uh, three measures the the biodiversity the the cultures and also the the language and uh, this is something that need to be account that maybe when we talk about uh, the loss of biodiversity, we need also to account the possibility it was lost because we also lost the language and also lost the uh, uh, the, the diversity of uh, culture because the human that lives uh, in that area uh, has lost their ability or, or knowledge uh, uh, and their perception and how to, uh, uh, to conserve uh, species which I'm going to talk uh, later uh, on the topic of uh, Komodo. So uh, from the biocultural uh, diversity perspective, uh, scientists that focus to study uh, cultural uh, biodiversity and how they perceive, classify and name species, usually uh, they were separate into uh, uh, several uh, uh, study. Uh, one is, uh, uh, the uh, the ethnobotany is Indonesian. We are very much uh, uh, understand about the concept of uh, jamu. Actually, like fifteen minutes before we start, the ibu jamu I just uh, passed my my house, and I uh, I managed to buy some of, of the jamu. But jamu itself is uh, uh, come from the uh, Javanese uh, language, uh, and the utilization of uh, plants. Uh, and medicine as a traditional medicine uh, is really embedded now in Indonesia, especially now with the era of the COVID-19, everyone want to be healthy uh, in uh, a traditional ways. So the use of uh, uh, traditional plan for uh, traditional herbal medicine, I, I think is already more increased now. Uh, and the term of jamu is now, uh, I think, has been adopted into Indonesian language, everyone now. Uh, even though it's not Javanese, every now, everyone know what is uh, Jamu. Uh, uh, so the, the study of uh, regional plants and their practice uh, used through the traditional knowledge of local culture. This is what we call ethnobotany and a lot of uh, research now is more on ethnobotany. But less uh, known is the uh, ethnozoology is uh, the, the learning uh, of uh, how people use or perceive uh, the, the animal uh, around them. And of course, ethnozoology then brands into other learning depending on the taxon, for instance, because I'm doing have pathology, uh, there are, if you try to Google, they uh, even have this ethnohepatology uh, study. So let's look if we are actually familiar with the concept of ethnoherpetology. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to, to show you, this is a picture I taken from, uh, from the internet. Uh, this is a wedding ceremony uh, for uh, people from Betawi ethnic. This is uh, the, the, the people that the, the local people of Jakarta. Uh, and uh, during marriage ceremony, uh, roti buaya or the crocodile bread is always uh, appear. And in one paper uh, published last year, Sihotang et al. stated that the use of uh, roti buaya is uh, based from local knowledge that had been carried out for generation that use the symbol of loyalty based on the uh, crocodile's character, uh, characteristic in uh, nature. Of course, bread itself uh, that doesn't come from uh, it come from outside, uh, so most probably during the colonial time. Uh, but even during the colonial time in the 1700s something, uh, Jakarta is, have a lot of crocodiles because they are in the wetlands. Um, and they can actually go deep into uh, the Chiliung River. So uh, the, the crocodile is not only in, in, the, in the sea. Uh, so. Interestingly, uh, we we see that uh, the old people understand, you know, how 
crocodile live and try to infuse them into uh, their uh, uh, ceremony. And of course, we have lost most of the crocodiles now in Jakarta, uh, except the, the Buaya Darat, of course. Um, and whenever you see uh, a paper or, or uh, an information about uh, Buaya Naus in Indonesia or in, in Jakarta, uh, it's always met with fear and historical click by, uh, by the media. Uh, it's always like saying like this, impossible to have uh, buaya, but you have to remember that many, many years ago, we still have buaya or the crocodiles in uh, Indonesia. And yes, we fear uh, the reptiles. Uh, there's an interesting uh, paper in 2019 uh, by a group of scientists from the Czech uh, Republic about human perception of all reptiles and is focusing on the relationship between fear, disgust, disgust and aesthetic preference. And it was led by a zoologist paper, but uh, the member include people that working with the Institute of Meta, uh, Mental Health. So this is really uh, interesting. And they found that the perception of human to, uh, to, uh, to reptiles mostly comes into two groups, fear and disgust. Uh, and fear and disgust is actually uh, negatively correlated with beauty. But surprisingly, they found that for snakes, uh, this is sometimes it's not only fear and disgust, but also uh, uh, they uh, people say it's a beauty. So the in in the reptile human studies is often. And, and unbalanced uh, in the majority of them because usually they focus on species that stimulate uh, fear. Uh, but the scientist ha has uh, known that uh, fear is differs between culture and also uh, gender. And this is some of the species that considered, uh, you know, uh, fearsome: uh, the crocodiles, uh, the snakes, and also the uh, the the lizard, the big lizard or the paranym. Uh, so I'm going to talk more now about uh, this uh, in the case of. Uh, human and Komodo uh, relationship uh, in Komodo. So two years ago, one of my students uh, did a research in National Park uh, of Komodo uh, on the human dangerous reptiles interaction. Um, and uh, the Komodo National Park, of course, is well known for its spectacular reptiles, the Komodo dragon or the Paranus uh, komodoensis. And and you can see in the map, uh, there's three, uh, three big uh, island that have the Komodo. Uh, the biggest one is Pulau Komodo, the Komodo Island, and then the Rincha Island. And there's a small one, Pulau Padar, Padar Island. Uh, but uh, in Padar Island, there is no uh, human uh, communities live over there. There's no village. The village is only uh, in uh, Komodo Island and in Pulau Rincha. And the village of Komodo and uh, the village of Rincha consists of different communities. The village of Komodo consider themselves mostly of Komodo ethnic. So when you talk about Komodo, it's not only talking about the animal or the island, but also uh, in ethnic. They call themselves Atamodo and the island as Atanamodo. Whereas, as you can see, in the uh, village of Rinja, there's consists of people that mostly uh, describe themselves as a Flores Bajo. And also a little bit of people from ethnic Komodo and Bugis, Bima and Papagarang. And both villages, so both community in this uh, two island consider uh, seven reptiles that is dangerous. Uh, which is the Paranus komodensis, the komodo itself, and three species, uh, four species of uh, uh, snakes, the Najas tatric, Trimeresurus, Trimeresurus alborabris, the Boya simensis, and the Crocodilus porosus, or the Buaya, and the other lizard, the Paranus salvator. And from that uh, seven uh, dangerous reptile, 
the the first the number one considered uh, dangerous is Komodo dragon, uh, followed by three species of uh, venomous snake, which is the Najas tatric or the cobra. Uh, the Trimarasaurus uh, insularis is the uh, piper, uh, the tree piper, and Daboya is the uh, uh, the pit piper. And yeah, but when uh, we asked the the people from this Akamodo whether they have stories or folk uh, tale uh, around the animal that they consider dangerous. They do have two stories. One is when they talk about uh, this uh, venomous snake, uh, the Daboya uh, siamensis. This is a very uh, highly uh, dangerous snake because uh, the bite will cause you bleeding, you have hematoxin and also neurotoxin. And there's no antivenom in Indonesia. Uh, you need to in, import the antivenom from, from Thailand. And in Komodo Island, the, the snake is called Kaka Botek. So Kaka is snake and Botek is a weather sarum. So it seems like the, the snakes look like uh, a weather a sarum. And they have a folklore that the, uh, the snake is actually an incarnation of a human who wants to take offense on her stepmother. So this is a female form. Uh, and that's why if a woman uh, uh, forbidden, they are cursed and they will immediately uh, die. Uh, and, but because they think that the snake is part of human being before, if they found the snake, they avoid it. They don't want to kill it because it's part of them. But in Rinja, they don't have this kind of stories. For them, this is a very uh, dangerous animal. And just like the common Indonesia, whatever snake you found, even if it's non venomous, you just kill it first and ask later what species is this. Um, so, and how, let's see Ibu how Misa, the whole community uh, perceives a uh, common. Your time is yeah? five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, yes. So, uh, in Komodo Island, the name of Komodo is Ora. Uh, in the folklore, Komodo is the twin son of the head chef, Umbunajo. One born as a human, the other as a dragon who choose to live in the forest. If one of the Ura, Ura is hurt, his human family will also be hurt. So in the last few days, the development of Komodo National Park has been under scrutiny. Uh, we can even say under six because there's a picture of Komodo uh, versus the truck which is an analogy of the Komodo dragon under the threat of development. Uh, but there's actually a more interesting uh, story about it because the Komodo National Park is never uh, empty of human. There's never the point of human. Before, before it becomes a national park, there's always people living in the land uh, there. And uh, through myths and folklore, the Komodo Island people is always say that they're okay with the Komodo. Uh, they don't fear them. If they just uh, if they capture eat their uh, their chickens or uh, the goat is okay because they just need food. Uh, so when the national park decided to fence the uh, the, the the fillets, uh, the Desa Komodo said no. We don't want to to fence this. Mostly they are disagree because they are they say that they are part of the Komodo. But it's different with the Rinja. They're just happy with the fence. But we have to remember that to maintain the fence is not easy and it, it is costly. Then sometimes the communities are able to, to sneak in. And since the islanders in Rinja has lost the connection with the Komodo dragon, they become sterile uh, with interaction. They don't really know how to deal with Komodo. And they end up always complaining to the national park management. Now we have also to remember that the development of Komodo National Park for tourism has been increased tenfold. Uh, and some of the people say that we have to make sure that the, the, the island, there is no village over there. We have to move there because we need to think about the conservation of the, the Komodo. Uh, as uh, people that the study in that area, I'm, I'm really not happy with the way that uh, people think about it because it's not really wise 
uh, to move people that is actually they're really uh, helping in consultation uh, with uh, the, the Komodo. Uh, and we have also to remember that Komodo is not only in Komodo National Park, but also in Flores. And people in Flores already have lost touch with the Komodo and the habitat is not protected. And also th uh, they have lost the, the myths and, and the stories. And if they found Komodo, it can't be like, just like kill them and keep quiet because they don't want to have Komodo because they're protected and it makes their, their life miserable if people know that there's a Komodo over there. Um, so yeah, when we talk about the conservation of wildlife, especially now with the Komodo dragon, we couldn't really say that we have to just protect the Komodo and uh, avoid it with human uh, uh, any human interaction. This is a complex issue. We are not talking about the population of that species or the biological variables. We need to account the relationship between local people and, the, and, and wildlife. And if we want to maintain the healthy coexistence, uh, we need to depend on the knowledge and the willingness of local people to maintain its cultural uh, heritage. Uh, I think if we can make sure that people also in the Flores Island have this cultural heritage, uh, have a connection with Komodo, we can make sure that the Komodo is not only live happily in Komodo National Park, but also in Flores area. So this is for my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bimirza. It seems that uh, ice cream, ice cream uh, <laughs> bike <laughs> passed by. Yes, it is. I heard that. <laughs> I was like, why well, ice cream? <laughs> do, do, do. Very, yeah, I heard that. It's very interesting uh, presentation. So I would say like uh, uh, it is really important to acknowledge uh, local, local knowledge. Yeah? to explain the whole context where, I mean, the animals, relations with the animals can be put, can be understood only within the whole context. This is what complexity is about. And I think uh, it is also interesting uh, to learn that, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like an uh, antithesis to dual di di dichotomy that Busaras explained earlier. So conservation is either this or that, but you need also to dig deeper into the type of relations which is uh, rooted from the values constructions of reality in its sense is how the local community uh, value their relations with the certain animals like Komodo and that's influenced the way of their thinking, the way of feeling, even feeling of fear. And it's, we need also to consider that in uh, doing a conservation. So thank you very much. I learned a lot, uh, Ibu Mirza. <laughs> now we move to uh, our second uh, panelist. Our second uh, panelist, uh, it is uh, Pak Chris. Also Pak Chris, are you there? I yes. am. Yeah. Okay, mm. Pak Chris also will explain further also about this local knowledge. Pak Chris has been, uh, Pak Chris can speak uh, fluently about Indonesia, I think, because uh, Pak Chris also has been working for some times in Indonesia through different kind of engagements, such as uh, uh, involved in the Lestari project, uh, involved in MC and MMC, Green Prosperity, and also the Global Green Growth for the uh, program in North Kalimantan, West Papua, Papua. So many different kind of uh, engagements Pak Chris already uh, has with in, in the context of Indonesia. And currently, Pak Chris works as John's professor at, of food and resource economic group, groups at uh, University of British Columbia, yeah, Pak? Yeah. Uh, so, from Pak Chris, uh, we will learn also more about Pak Chris uh, mentions about uh, Kearifan local or indigenous knowledge. We've seen also so many different uh, kind of groups that demonstrated applications uh, of uh, the local knowledge that very much effective in uh, fighting against challenges of the climate change, for instance, and how this local knowledge of the indigenous knowledge able to mobilize the five capitals, namely assets, uh, in the indigenous, human, social, natural, financial, whether or overall stewardship governance or direct management. Uh, but, uh, from Pak Chris, uh, we will learn also how this 
indigenous knowledge perceived as social capitals will contribute greatly in building genuine landscape based on uh, based on local context ya pak ya uh, include that uh, social capital is really important to to map out really genuine landscapes that offer actually development sectoral approaches like all of, across different kind of sectorals in uh, development policies uh, including KLHS apalagi pak uh, RPJM uh, RPJMN dan RPJM lokal ya Pak ya provinsi. <laughs> so Pak Chris, uh, I'm ready to learn and also to listen to your uh, presentation. Silakan Pak. Okay, can you hear me and can you see me? Yes. In that case, I Clearly. will upload. I hope I will upload. Okay, can you see my presentation now? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, bear with me a moment, if you would. As it's I, okay, Pa. You'll okay. have 30 minutes, Pa. Thank you so much, and I shall do my very best to keep to 30 minutes. And I will welcome you to interrupt me if I go beyond. Thank you, Ibu uh, Yulia. Thank you all for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to... Uh, connect with you uh, again at CTSS, uh, University of IPB. Uh, thank you all uh, for allowing me to share one of my passions. Uh, I would go so far as to say it's my jihad uh, and my crusade. Um, and of course, you can probably guess from the words that I'm using that I am a provocateur. I'm a provocateur, <laughs> yeah? But provocateur pikiran. I have no yeah, interest yeah. in politics. Basically, uh, I'd like to share with you in the, in the half an hour how uh, tremendously valuable uh, indigenous uh, knowledge uh, can be, uh, and I think is underappreciated, and especially uh, important now during this era of recovery from COVID and all the other challenges that Indonesia faces. And so I'd like to suggest to you that uh, it will be no surprise, given what you've heard earlier, that uh, Indonesia does not just have a great endowment of biological diversity, uh, flora and fauna, but also uh, endowment functions, uh, an endowment, if you will, of indigenous knowledge, which I will refer to as local knowledge, because as important as it is amongst customary peoples, masyarakat adat, it's also important amongst those who wouldn't ordinarily be considered as my Sharakat Adad. Basically, uh, there are five parts to my presentation. Uh, one is a, a little bit of an overview of indeed what kind of endowments uh, or Ka'arifan local or local knowledge there are in Indonesia, the range of endowments, which are so tremendously important, which really need no introduction, but I will give a quick overview of that. And then a persistent challenge. And that challenge is that despite this, sadly, there is not as much appreciation as there might be by policymakers, decision makers, and planners, and so forth, about the tremendous value and contribution of local knowledge to development in Indonesia, especially today. We have an opportunity. We're all suffering through uh, COVID, of course, one reason why this is online, uh, presumably, but nonetheless, it represents an opportunity because, uh, inshallah, uh, we all hope that ultimately we will emerge from this and we will build back better, as many say. And during that building back better, during that economic recovery, uh, there is an opportunity to take uh, more seriously indigenous knowledge or local knowledge and how to incorporate local knowledge into landscape functions and societal values is the fourth part. And the fifth part is to talk about effectiveness and innovation. So we'll begin with the, uh, the endowments that there are here of uh, local knowledge uh, in Indonesia. My focus will be fundamentally on terrestrial. You've had uh, very learned people talking to you about the marine uh, dimension. I will focus on the on the uh, on the dimension which is really to do with uh, terrestrial capital. 
and uh, the fact that local knowledge has tremendous value for climate change mitigation and adapt adaptation, as well as natural disasters. Indeed, local knowledge uh, can enhance the five fundamental de development assets. Thank you, Ibu Yulia, for mentioning them. They were much more popular 20 years ago, and I'm trying to revive them now. When we think about capital and assets, we think about financial assets, but natural assets, human assets, social assets, relational assets such as trust, and especially indigenous or local uh, knowledge are fundamental to whether we'll be able to have sustainable development or not. Whether we are the stewards, pamanku, or whether we are implementing the uh, land use management ourselves. Local knowledge can be endogenous, that which is discovered by local people themselves, or, and here is where it's really exciting, and I'll show you some examples later, it can respond to the recommendations of science and technology, of, of modern science and technology. But again, my point is that it still remains uh, under, underappreciated in policymaking, planning, and implementation, as well as oversight. What kind of endowments are there? Uh, basically, uh, I'll focus um, on, on, on the first few of these. Uh, I could talk for hours and hours, but I will save you that, and you will save me that by not stopping this too soon. Uh, local knowledge has been proven scientifically to have tremendous value across Indonesia, from Aceh to Papua, from Manado to uh, Entete, uh, for soil and water conservation for fire management and control by local communities, uh, for natural and planted agroforests, which are often in the buffer zone of the rainforest that are so important to Indonesian biodiversity, uh, part of the landscape of the forestry, agroforestry land landscape. Tremendous sources of uh, information and uh, ability to control pests and diseases, which, which have defeated modern science. Higher yielding crop varieties, better crop varieties. We heard from Ibu Maria from Flores about sorghum. There are countless examples of this. My experience was mostly with coffee and cocoa and uh, rubber and uh, cloves and other spices as well. Natural disaster mitigation, the, the famed example of the uh, tsunami in Aceh, uh, which in one island uh, harmed very few people because of their local knowledge of the Samong, of the, great, uh, of the great wave and the great quake, which they remembered from 100 years before, that meant that most of them were able to run to safety. That too is a kind of local knowledge, which is so valuable. And although my focus will be on the rural dimension, let's not forget the urban dimension. Thanks to the Pumulung and the, and, and the Lapak, thanks to the rag pickers, the scavengers, uh, great cities in Indonesia have much less waste than they would other have because that waste is recycled. And a lot of that is from a local knowledge, which ultimately feeds into industry. In fact, one of, my, uh, one of my mantras will be that uh, I don't see local knowledge and modern knowledge as separate, but in desperate need of working more closely together. And that's one of the great challenges. One of the most fa famous examples is Krui in, uh, in Western Lombok. And what looks like a natural rainforest is not indeed a natural rainforest. This is uh, Shoria Javanika, the, the, the Damar, which is, uh, has been planted for over 150 years, not just because of its inherent value in situ, but the local knowledge that it protects the water resources for what you see in the foreground, which is rice cultivation. Look at how, this is in Western Java, look at how careful uh, farmers are. You may not like the fact they're using plastic, sometimes they use uh, banana stems, but they are very careful to make sure that as the water flows from, from, one, uh, from one paddy field to another, there's no erosion because plastic or sometimes banana stems will mean that uh, you don't lose uh, water uh, at the side of the paddy fields. This too is an example of the application of local knowledge. 
And here too, something that seems to scare a lot of uh, people is uh, uh, on a slope, cleared land, but uh, because of local knowledge, especially the Javanese uh, guludan, as it's called, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but basically uh, trash uh, captures any uh, soil that is washed uh, away uh, into the trash uh, terraces, temporary terraces. During the dry season, this is used to cover the soil to prevent evaporation. And then the, the new trees after the food crops are grown in the, uh, these guludan or these uh, temporary terraces, very, very humus and compost rich, leading to agroforests which uh, replicate those in private land. This is in actual fact, a community forest area inside state forest areas. A few, three years later, and then seven years later, providing food for the local economy, as well as those who uh, obviously uh, own and manage those, uh, those areas themselves. And then another kind of social uh, forestry, this time in Java, quite phenomenal quite phenomenal. This is drip irrigation. And I challenge anyone in the world to have more sophisticated drip irrigation than the people of Kalibiru. And this is a bamboo here. Can you see Julia my cursor or not? You can. Good. Thank you. So basically bamboo that is filled here with water. Here is a Melinjo seedling. And this is, and the farmer in this case uh, this is almost 20 years ago, and now one of the advantages of being as old as I am is that I can follow and trace uh, these kinds of initiatives that apply local knowledge over time. And with his axe, he uh, split here, you can see the split, the base of the bamboo. And so basically the water he put in there that he gathered from two kilometers away to drip irrigate this uh, Melinjo fruit tree, something that no industrial timber plantation uh, generally would ever do in Indonesia. So really quite high tech. Uh, again, uh, I think more high tech than even something that you might find uh, in Israel. I, I, I suggest that this is very, very sophisticated and it is local knowledge. What was the result of this? Uh, in the top right hand corner, you see denuded land, but once the community had rights from the Ministry of Forestry to use this state land, they converted it to forest below, to agroforest. So they reforested it. We're going to revisit this in a minute as we go through the presentation. And then perhaps the most sophisticated of all the slope agriculture soil conservation and water conservation systems in Indonesia. And this is in Papua. And this is about 1500 years old, a little bit before independence. And uh, with Chamara or the Casuarina being used as a shade tree and sweet potato in terraces on slopes sometimes that are 60 degrees and yet no erosion whatsoever. The terracing not made by soil or by rocks but by wooden trellises here. And when I visited this area some years ago, I waited for the very inevitable heavy rainfall and there was absolutely no sedimentation from this. It was completely secure. So slope agriculture, which by the way, is breaking the rules of the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, but not because it's on two steep slopes, but nonetheless is indeed uh, conserving soil it's conserving uh, water, and at the same time, it's providing incomes for the poor. To continue, fire, fire management, local knowledge application uh, in uh, West, uh, West Kalimantan, where great pains are taken uh, on the mineral soils to make sure that there are fire breaks so that when a smallholder clears the land to replant the rubber, as you can see there, this is, this is free of any vegetation here, there will be no spread. And also too, I could add that they only burn in the middle of the day when it's very hot. So it's a very hot burn, it's not a slow burn, very little smoke. And of course it involves social capital as well because this fellow would have been accompanied by other villagers to make sure that there is no spread uh, into his neighbor's plot. And then something I saw uh, just a year ago, which, which, which really dumbfounded me, 
This is one of the most beautiful rainforest uh, areas in Indonesia today. One, there are many, of course, but it's in private land. It's in areal dengan penggunaan lain. It's not in kawasan hutan negara. It's completely surrounded by oil palm and pepper. And uh, in the past, uh, logging companies wanted to log it, but the community here said, no, because we value this forest, uh, because it protects our water resources, we will not sell these kinds of trees. This is a yellow Maranti, one of the biggest and most valuable Marantis, uh, or Shorias, or Damas. Uh, which which uh, is valued uh, at between ten and fifteen thousand uh, dollars, but the entire community has protected this. They've won the Kalpataro, an Indonesian uh, distinction award, for protecting this, and they've got this uh, recognized as well by uh, the uh, the Bupati, the head of the regency. And on Google Earth, by the way, you can see this little green spot here which uh, shows that it is an island of green, a, a, a green rainforest, not so much as a source of wood, uh, although they will use it as a source of seed, but to protect water resources. And this reminds us too that local knowledge throughout Indonesia is often driven by this imperative, which is important, not just to local people, but downstream urban dwellers, and that is water resources. Another reminder, of course, that throughout Indonesia, this is East Kalimantan, uh, the, the forest land, uh, which you see in green, the state forest land and the villages, which uh, have uh, black boundaries here, overlap with each other. It's really irrelevant whether you say that village land is inside the forest area or forest areas are inside the village land. The point is they're both in the same landscape, a strong argument. For them to work together and to the credit of Indonesia uh, and uh, the forestry and uh, environment uh, ministry there's more and more interest in this kind of collaboration which was not the case during the Suharto era the Suharto regime uh, which ended in 1998. The same can be said in Papua only even more so uh, where 85 percent of all villages are indeed in state forest areas or state uh, state forest areas are in the, uh, within uh, village areas. So this, 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 this intimate relationship between the two, where uh, local knowledge is so important, and this applies also on the other side of Indonesia and Aceh. This is a, a, a village development uh, map produced for the uh, local village uh, development um, uh, planning process which shows that within it, uh, in the village of Lawe Chimanuk, uh, part of the Loisa ecosystem, we find the national park here and downstream where we have the rice and so on and so forth, we, we see uh, the agricultural areas. And a keen understanding uh, of both of the importance of forest biodiversity for water resources. This is East Kalimantan again, which shows how villages are distributed along waterways. So this, intricate uh, relationship between Benang Biru, the blue thread of the rivers, uh, which is well understood by local communities, and also uh, one would hope also the regulations, which is the Benang Mera or the red thread, uh, something of a challenge sometimes. And this characteristic occurs all over Indonesia. The vast majority of the population of Indonesia, whether in village land or in state forest areas uh, overlapping each other, uh, live uh, within those areas or within the downstream areas. We now live in this downstream area. Those of you who are in Bogor, those of you who are in Jakarta, we are downstream of these forest areas. 99%, except for those living in tiny, tiny islands, uh, depend uh, upon this uh, this fact, and one would hope that local knowledge would be incorporated in the management of water resources, which is so important during the dry season and to prevent floods and landslides. The persistent L, uh, LK challenge is, of course, that uh, the challenge of incorporating local knowledge into research and development. Yes, it is written in policies. We'll look at the policies in a minute. But oftentimes it's difficult for researchers and developers to really take on board the knowledge that we've learned about uh, from Ibu Maria uh, and others 
uh, of local people. There is a credential gap between the poorly educated farmer, for example, and the more highly educated researcher. And, and this, this can be a challenge, let alone a government functionary. But in many ways, farmers uh, are like Renaissance natural sciences. They're transdisciplinary. They're concerned with all kinds of issues. Then uh, unlike necessarily, it's not a criticism of modern science, but necessarily specialist, uh, specialist her herpetologists uh, or, or, uh, or entomologists, to name a couple of my friends, of necessity must specialize. But uh, we've lost this, uh, this sense, this broad-based appreciation of the interrelationship between the different kinds of flora and flora across, across landscapes. So that is, a, that, is, that is a challenge. It's been a challenge for the 20 years that I've been looking at local knowledge. We do have policy recognition. I was recently at a, present, at a conference on indigenous knowledge, local knowledge, and uh, people got a bit upset with me when I suggested that uh, policies uh, are not accommodating local knowledge. They said, of course they're there. Well, it's true. If you look at, and I've listed a number of the policies here, they will talk about social capital, uh, community participation. They will talk about local knowledge. The National Development Plan for 20 and 2024 20 talks about local knowledge. Great, that's wonderful. All credit to Indonesia. PP45, the government regulation 45 on community participation in regional governance, it does as well. And despite the opprobrium heaped on the omnibus law, it also uh, nods at the importance of uh, community participation. But the problem is that we still lack the pragmatic roadmaps. How can we integrate this wonderful font of knowledge that we've learned from the presenters earlier and that others have documented? Uh, how can we learn from them how to incorporate this into modern research and development? And I would suggest to you that that is still missing. And, and that is something that hopefully uh, CTSS uh, and others uh, might think of, of doing, not just identifying the relationships and the values of local knowledge, but how do we have roadmaps? How do we get local people and decision makers to work more comfortably together? And uh, we need a kind of reset, and we, and we do have this reset. It's an opportunity in 2020. Of course, everybody knows the misery that COVID is causing globally. And I don't need to run through these. These are familiar to you all in terms of the of the uh, shaken food security, loss of employment, and uh, the dramatic reduction in development budgets. Now is the time when the more formal side of Indonesia could benefit from local knowledge, if there is the political will, if there are the roadmaps to do so. And here I was very excited by Pratuan uh, Pemerintah Government Regulation 23, uh, which, which was about national economic recovery. Please, I beg you, those of you who don't like to read these decrees, I'm sure none of you will read the Undang Undang Cita, Cita Karja, which is a thousand pages. Uh, I'm reading it as we speak. But nonetheless, Article 3, Pasal Tiga of PP23 is really quite beautiful and very relevant to what uh, we're all trying to do here in terms of recognizing complexity, recognizing a role for people, their knowledge, their participation, but also a warning as we try to recover from COVID, as we try to uh, have infrastructure investments and so forth. This, these two words, strangely, it knocked me off my seat. In PP23 were kept in English in this government regulation, moral hazard to be avoided at all costs, unintended consequences to be avoided at all costs, as we try to recover as fast as possible in the interests of the people of Indonesia. We must uh, have safeguards, be careful that we uh, do not produce unintended effects. Integration of landscape functions, which science has, uh, has told us about, we're very familiar with, about how the landscape, the land uh, protects water resources, soil resources. Patrice, your time's uh, 10 minutes left. I know, thank you so much for the reminder. <laughs> I will finish on time. 
And because I particularly want to say something at the end uh, before you cut me off, but you may do so, although this is not a presidential debate. So basically, uh, let's re-emphasize the role of the five development assets. Finance, of course, assets or capital. Everybody thinks about that. Everybody's horrified by capitalism and capital, but there are other kinds of capital or asset uh, there, and they need to work better in combination. This was very much a theme in the 1990s and the 2000s, but I don't hear it so much. It's, it's not so, it's not so uh, fashionable, but let's revive it. And of course, one of those was indeed knowledge, which means not just tacit knowledge, local knowledge, but science-based knowledge. How to incorporate this? Well, incorporate it in detailed spatial planning at small scales that are understandable by local people as well as practitioners, as was intended by the spatial planning law. And also to be sure that strategic environmental assessments really are truly participatory for big projects, for the, the economic development plans, the FAGMD as well as spatial planning as well. And here explicitly, uh, this would have to be a guideline from somewhere, maybe from Deb Dagri, Home Affairs, uh, maybe from Bapanas, maybe from Kalaka, the Ministry of Environment uh, and, uh, and Forestry, but basically to follow what the National Development Plan has said and think about how we can make use in our formal plans and policies and our oversight of local knowledge. Um, many, many examples. I, I want to rush through this uh, of how this is already being applied. Participatory, uh, excuse me, whoops. Participatory spatial planning, whereby in Aceh, in Western Indonesia, uh, the kinds of private smallholder agroforests, look at this. Anybody who doesn't know rainforest and agroforest would think that this was a natural forest. It's not, it's entirely planted, entirely planted within private land. So too, inside the border region, is it replicated inside state forest areas where it is technically illegal until of course, one particular program a couple of years ago, working together with the Ministry of Forestry and Forestry Agencies, together with local people, was able to do participatory zonation, whereby the local people chose only a small uh, border area where they wanted to do their uh, local agroforestry based on local knowledge. And if you look at the entire area in this district, it represented a very small area, but a significant buffer area to the Loisa National Park. Same too with the strategic environmental assessment. These are local villagers. We need to make an, a, an attempt to involve them more in visualizing bow what we need to avoid uh, through development uh, and optimal, what we want to see. And you can see it's more complex, it's more integrated, their visualization of this, using their local knowledge, anticipating their social capital as well as a recommendation in this particular case to spatial planning. And the importance of visualizing these results. I mean, the science is fantastic. We're, we're all publishing in international journals and that's marvelous, but we need to better visualize for the decision makers as well as local people what this means at various scales, household, community, and the wider landscape when, it, when we talk about integration of local knowledge in, uh, in development, uh, particularly uh, planning and policy making. And then finally, uh, th th this, uh, oh dear, now I don't know how to go back. How do I do that? Oh no. Um, can you help me out here? Probably not. Well, look, um, Although maybe I can, oh, look at that. I'm not quite as handicapped as I thought I was. But basically local knowledge fosters integration of landscape functions with society, uh, societal values. It gives us a sense of shared ownership. We, we heard from the earlier pr uh, presentation, there was a bit of tension uh, that I picked up in uh, Komodo uh, about those who would like to keep villages away from the Komodo dragons and those who say, no, we want them to be uh, more as they have been for 
for centuries, if not thousands of years integrated. The point is that what we need on the part of villagers and on the part of uh, civil servants and functionaries, a greater sense of shared ownership and local capital, the way in which local people organize themselves uh, can help to bring this about. The Javanese expression is rumongso melu handarbeni, a sense of shared ownership. This can be revived. I know that this had a bad name for itself during the Suharto era, but we need to rethink this through and how to roadmap it. How can we get uh, ordinary villagers with their tacit local knowledge to work better with uh, civil servants, researchers, so that we get transdisciplinary uh, development, so that we get more intersectoral coordination with it between sectors, as well as between sectors and local communities to avoid what is known as egocentralism. Uh, the results of this, amazing, uh, an amazing result whereby engineers to the credit of the uh, water resource uh, public works uh, facility in central Kalimantan and the peatland reforestation uh, agency, uh, then uh, with the direction of the now uh, vice minister of uh, forestry and the environment, work with local people so that local people's knowledge could be used to improve the design of dams which reduced the water flow out of the peatland and reduced, therefore, the risk to fire. The result of this is that where we had this kind of participatory FPIC, free power informed consent, in the village of Garung in central Kalimantan, in 1919, almost no fires. The only fires there in the peatlands spread from the neighboring village where there was no such participation between government agencies uh, and local villages. And th this is scientifically proven. These are the fire hotspots, almost none where you had this collaboration between villagers, scientists, as well as engineers and local decision makers. And it's this kind of legacy that we want to promote as we want to see more infrastructure development, which is important for Indonesia, but nonetheless to make sure that we are incorporating local knowledge. Without this local knowledge, those dams would not have been as effective. But the engineers, to their credit, did accept that there was local knowledge they should take into account. And therefore, they, made, they, they adjusted the shape of the dams. They made them wider. Uh, there were other small details. Also, too, 15 years later, uh, really exciting uh, in the island of Lombok, community forests, which uh, at one time focused uh, simply on uh, reforestation, have enjoyed what Pahusin uh, Alatas will remind us all uh, emergent phenomena. They have thought outside the box. Nobody imagined this. Where they, were where they successfully reforested the land, the local communities, they invited then private companies to pay them for water services for their microhydro and for the city of Mataram to also pay them to keep that in place. Really exciting. And perhaps the most amazing emergent phenomenon of all to come back to this drip irrigation area where everybody focused on the, uh, on the reforestation in central Java in Kalibiru. But nonetheless, uh, this became so amazing, the successful reforestation by local communities with their own sweat equity, human resources, that eventually many visitors came. And then, then the villagers realized that the village has ecotourism value. And so, that the, so now most of their revenue comes from ecotourism, something that was not anticipated, very beautiful strongly recommend you go there one day, uh, whilst they still maintain the cover of the forest. So really exciting emergent phenomenon, something that wasn't anticipated before, that adds value to community forestry, that adds value to local knowledge. Now, this is my last slide before you cut me off, Ibu Yulia, and allow me in the interest of uh, something that fascinates me, but I'm not an expert in, uh, but to be a little bit po poetic and philosophical, and share with you uh, something for us all about how tacit local knowledge, valuable experiential knowledge can complement and enhance science-based research and development, increasing understanding about today's challenges and opportunities written by 
you know, I love things that are old, not just because I'm old, but, you know, this was said 800 years ago, 400 years before Shakespeare. Nasser od Dintusi, a Persian philosopher and poet and mathematician as well, by the way, he was also a scientist. Anyone who knows and knows that he knows makes the steed of intelligence leap over the vault of heaven. I don't think many of us in that position. I'm not because I'm still learning. The second one is the one I identify with. He went on to say, anyone who does not know but knows that he does not know, can bring his lame little donkey to the destination, destination nonetheless. And the warning, a warning about moral hazard. Anyone who does not know and does not know that he does not know is stuck forever in double ignorance. Thank you very much uh, to all of you, Ibu Yulia especially. Thank you for not interrupting me because this was the most important part of my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, just to the, the last part uh, really hits me so hard. The, uh, the, the point that you described is also reminds me of the point that they described by uh, Jalaluddin Rumi said the highest learning is the unlearning. <laughs> so. we, sometimes we have to go through unlearning. I couldn't agree more. Yes. <laughs> that's a really, that's a really beautiful point. Thank you for sharing. And I think uh, for me personally, uh, uh, kind of like light bulb moment when you explain, yes. uh, when you mentioned about the high tech, I mean, all of these times we are so entrapped with this modern paradigm and thinking about high tech technology is artificial intelligence, like really, you know, high, really, that kind of technology. But we learn, uh, I learned, especially just now, that high tech can be really locally, locally produced by local humble material and it functions so well. And we call it also high tech. So <laughs> kind of also a light bulb for me <laughs> to think more about what do we really mean about high tech? What do we really mean about progress? Uh, what kind of, uh, and realize me also how I have been entrapped with this modern paradigm way of thinking. Uh, thank you, Pa. And also interesting to know more about later maybe in the future how the engagement between the, the decisions makers and local community to so participatory policy making process. Okay, now let's move to our next panelists for more inspirations and uh, very uh, fruitful insights. Our next panelist, Ibu Karen, Ibu Karen von Zuterven, uh, Ibu Karen von Zuterzenka, Ibu Karen, are you there? Ibu Karen, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear you. Okay. Ibu Karen is a marine ecologist. Now from the land, we move to the uh, landscape. We move to the seascape now. Oh, this is really nice. Um, and Ibu Karen, also, you were in Bogor for six years, Yabu. You used to teach uh, in IPB University from 2007 until 2013 through the AAD, uh, German Academic Exchange Service, which is put us in the same because I'm also the AAD alumni. <laughs> and currently, <laughs> Ibu also work as a um, researcher and consultant at Leibniz Institute for Tropical Marine Research, ZMT, and also researcher and consultant from Gilmar Hampholz Center for Oceans Research in Kiel. Now, from Ibu Kanen, we will hear more about uh, how complexity described in the seascape. From, from landscape, now we move to the seascape. And Ibu, you will also explain through different kind of uh, cor uh, core examples of marine challenges, uh, how, this, uh, how we also see the, the, the seascapes and where also the narratives from the people, the perspective and traditions also being also put in such a context. And it, then from your explanation, we learn also more about 
how this kind of complexity require new or hidden solutions. Now, I'm not going to give you more spoiler alert. <laughs> I'm ready to listen and to learn from you, Ibu. Silahkan. Thank you very much, Bu Yuya. Um, may I share my screen? Yes. Can you see me and see the presentations? We can see you, Bo, but uh, not yet the presentation. Okay. Yeah, we can see the presentations now. Very good. So thanks again for um, the nice introduction and also for inviting me because uh, this is uh, giving me an opportunity to also renew my relationships to EPB and uh, Indonesia. And this is quite something which is very important to me. And uh, in this time, we are more than uh, yeah, um, due to um, involve in discussions and uh, open communication, uh, especially also in times of a pandemic situation where everybody is involved. So first, um, I want to talk about complexity. And um, complexity is something which is overwhelming people. So um, if we go back to, to the basics of this, complexity just means the whole is more complex and meaningful than its parts. So if we can look at uh, a pattern like this, we probably can also uh, reshape the whole thing and uh, have a different pattern. If we apply this figure on the coral reefs, uh, then we might have um, a different uh, approach. So we have uh, a lot of uh, different species involved and uh, a lot of um, shapes and um, different life forms. If you look at the same pattern, same parts, a different pattern. And uh, in this case, a current adds to the whole story. That means uh, we have different growth forms and uh, different um, shapes involved, but the same ingredients. <coughs> Can you still see me? Yes, we still can see you. Both. We can see you. Both. Okay, you can see the presentation as well because I seem to face a problem here. Uh, I can. Uh, we can see the presentations both. But okay. I think it's still in the complexity uh, 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 diagram okay. or illustration. Uh, yeah, okay. Excuse me, uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Karen, we are actually playing your presentation. So if you need to uh, slide to the next presentation, uh, you may... Uh, announced to us like next yeah. or something uh, like that. I will, I will try once again. Yes. And then you can uh, probably you, you start from your slide. So can you see the next slide now? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. 
So it's probably better you start from your screen. Okay. Seem to be Very a problem with my connection, yes. Do you need to go to the next slide, Dr. Uh, Karen? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> there will be okay. uh, there will be a, a lot of uh, individual slides. I'm sorry for that, but I hope yeah. it's working. So you can see the okay. next one. Yeah. Okay. So um, actually, um, this small hindrance also reminds of uh, uh, us of uh, the structure of complexity, uh, because some unexpected things may happen. And this is actually what I want to talk about, also that my background is slightly <laughs> varied. Um, so complexity means that the same parts can have different patterns. Can you go to the next slide, please? And one of the examples uh, I want to give to you uh, is the coral reefs. Uh, I do not have to explain about coral reefs in Indonesia uh, in the middle of the coral triangle. So you have a lot of different species with different life forms and a high degree of complexity. So you may have a look at uh, one uh, part of the story. Um, for instance, um, the, the nice view you can see uh, on the screen. Next, please. But uh, the same species actually can uh, display a different view. For instance, if the um, currents um, are changing, then we might see different life forms and uh, different growth forms. So the same parts may display different patterns. Next, please. This is giving us some food for thoughts about um, patterns, resilience, and scales. I just um, added two examples of paper addressing that, including spatial self-organizations uh, for a new, um, actually um, a new finding on cold water coral, uh, coral structures in cold waters. And um, some, some time ago um, had been published for coral reefs as complex systems and uh, all uh, of you involved with this research know that a variety of publications and new findings and uh, research of coral reefs because it's needed urgently. Next, please. So uh, this is um, explaining uh, a little bit what complex adaptive systems include. And these are uh, the big patterns uh, which are hard to uh, study and hard to understand like weather and climate, very complex and uh, almost uh, in the long run unpredictable. We have a lot of different ecosystems. We have the human immune system, which is still a um, little understood. Um, economies and markets often behave uh, unpredictably. And uh, this is also true for human technological interactions like social networks. And next, please. So there are numerous factors and the relations, not all of them known. Uh, their behavior is hard to predict and uh, are aspects of self-organization. And all these uh, is trying to uh, be investigated by complexity uh, theory. So I'm not a mathematician or, next please. Yes, or a physicist, um, but um, there are some effects which might explain uh, a little bit um, what we have to face. So one of the effects uh, which is quite well known is the butterfly effect described by Lawrence um, a lot of uh, years ago uh, to describe deterministic nonlinear dynamic systems. And uh, the butterfly uh, effect uh, is illustrated as a change in one state can result in large difference in a later state by uh, the example of a butterfly. So if a butterfly sits uh, on top of a flower and flaps its wings, uh, probably nothing happens. Next, please. Probably uh, it results in the movement of a leaf and probably the movement of the leaf uh, will start a larger movement, will start a larger movement, will affect the uh, large scale weather pattern and uh, change the details of a tornado. This is known as a butterfly effect and uh, so a large discussion about that, uh, if it's going to be real and for the systems, it's, it can be applied. Next, please. So if you look from uh, 
the small flower and weather patterns uh, to the oceans, we see a vast area of blue. So um, you might recognize the Indonesian islands uh, and uh, the Pacific um, Ocean, large ocean, deep ocean basins, um, ocean ridges, and so on. So we have a large degree of complexity on a large scale. Next, please. But also complexity on a small scale. And um, interestingly, the butterfly effect has been also discussed uh, to be happening in the ocean, uh, especially for internal mixing. So we have, next, please. Very small organisms like plankton um, drifting in the ocean. We have fish, we have turtles, uh, we have jellyfish, and many, many more. High degree of biodiversity. They are all moving, and small movements might also cause larger movement movements. Next, please. So this is also food for thought that this uh, can also be happening in the ocean and affect. Uh, the overall patterns we observe. So um, there's a discussion a paper for a symposium I include. So who wants to follow up on that can do so. Next, please. So we have a high degree of complexity uh, in habitats uh, and ecosystems, uh, not only the abiotic and biotic factors um, affecting the individual organisms and populations like fish and turtles and uh, others, but also uh, the underlying geomorphology, um, natural disturbance, the ocean dynamics as such, climatic factors uh, overarching all these. And of course, last but not least, the anthropogenic interaction. Next, please. So uh, as scientists and also as members of society, uh, we like to put that into scales to deal with that. And um, this um, slide had been produced for a um, uh, talk uh, dealing with satellite imaging some years ago. So um, we can start from the individual niche, something we can investigate by uh, research methods uh, dealing with microhabitats, larger habitats and the uh, communities living there. We can go to the ecosystem scale, scale and uh, overall we can have a global view uh, with satellite imaging observing patterns. But, next please. We have to deal with the still unknown. Sorry, and is, it, is it only me that the, the screen is, keeps blinking? From your side, it's not blinking? It's okay for me. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's okay from us, okay. for me it's also okay. okay. This seems to be an interesting day today. <laughs> okay. Can I, shall I continue? Um, I think a uh, poor connection problem with Julia, so I think you can continue, Dr. Karen. Okay, I'll try to continue. Just uh, let me know if there's another problem. Um, so the uh, biodiversity uh, on a global scale uh, also include um, yeah, a lot of uh, different patterns and um, this um, had been addressed at a global scale as well. Um, you might know the intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, IPBS, which uh, was trying actually uh, to um, collect all this knowledge locally as well as globally. Next one, please. So if you talk about complexity and globalization, uh, one of the examples is plastic waste. Uh, I also have to not to go to into detail because this had been addressed several times already, but this is a global challenge and also a long-term legacy for all of us. Next one. So um, the management uh, problems are um, everywhere, uh, just in every community. Uh, but what I want to mention here is that um, what uh, we had decades ago uh, will still last for the decades to come. So this is something we have to add uh, as a temporal scale. Uh, so we cannot just deal with the situation on hand, then we have to go back to uh, the, uh, our um, uh, pattern and uh, see what uh, this implies for the, for the future. 
not only dealing with, with climate change issues, but also for, with substances which are released to the ocean and which are already there, even if we start um, changing management practices now. Next one, please. Yeah, and this had been also addressed by a recent paper by colleagues from, from ZMT, so um, adding some thoughts to the discussion. Next one, please. So uh, all this points to complexity awareness. Uh, we are aware now that we cannot live sustainably without the oceans. And uh, again, looking at the global scale, there are 66 large marine ecosystems which have been identified. Uh, mostly coastal areas, uh, shelf areas with a high production rate, and they add to more than 80% of uh, the global fish catch uh, in, in all societies. So actually, we cannot live uh, without uh, these ecosystems feeding us. Next one, please. This has been addressed by uh, governmental um, policy. So um, international ocean, ocean governance include uh, legal entities like UNCLOS, um, the International Food Organization, uh, environmental uh, issues um, dealt with by UNESCO and uh, also the International Maritime Organization and such. So there have been some effort made to um, address these issues globally. Next, please. And uh, all these um, issues add to complexity and uh, this means uncertainty and instability for the individuals and the local populations. Because uh, this is overwhelming most people, uh, not only the fishermen, but uh, also um, lecturers, uh, educators, um, local managers and uh, everybody in day life. Best example for that is the local, uh, the current pandemic, because this is adding uh, very unexpected uh, aspects of our lives and everybody has to deal with that. Next, please. So uh, this fisherman might ask, I need to feed my family. I have to catch fish. Fish is where the ecosystems are healthy. I have to catch fish, where can I sell it? I have to catch more fish because our family is growing. Our family is growing. Uh, that means can my children become fishers too? Will there still be fish in the ocean? And I have to catch fish and sell it. Do I use a plastic bag? My customers want a plastic bag or my customers already have a shop shopping bag. The sea level is rising now. Do I have to move with my house? I have to catch more fish and the family has to move. This might be the consequence of uh, the individual uh, choices to make. So this is an individual choice. And if you ask the fisherman's wife, she will have some different questions and answers. Uh, but the choice of one uh, on a family level might be the choice of many uh, and a game changer. Next, please. So uh, one uh, example is given uh, recently um, by our current situation in Germany because uh, the COVID-19 situation uh, led to avoidance of public transport. So everybody during summertime uh, tried to use bicycles to go to work or shopping. And uh, this observation uh, and by administration led to the uh, formation of new pop-up bicycle lanes in German cities. So there's a potential actually uh, to very quickly change behavior and that uh, led to at least partially to CO2 reduction in, in the cities. These uh, questions are addressed by social science, uh, but might be um, an example how individual change behavior can uh, add the, uh, to the game. Next, please. So I will not uh, go into detail about the sustainable development goals because you might uh, have seen and discussed that already a lot of times during um, this symposium. 
But uh, I want to mention that the complexity awareness um, represented by the goals are a paradigm shift in itself. So the acknowledgement of the complexity lead us to a new dis discussion uh, about how to address it. Next one. And this led also to uh, a new focus area in research. So uh, next year will uh, be the start of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development uh, with the motto, the science we need for the oceans we want. And uh, focusing especially on um, the goal 14 life below water in uh, close connection with climate actions, uh, dealing with uh, plastic waste and uh, uh, many, many more aspects, identifying base, scientific baselines and recommendations. Next, please. So the keywords for that, um, um, yeah, future developments are now transdisciplinarity. That's why we are all here and discussing that. Knowledge exchange, um, social learning, but also data science, big data and artificial intelligence and many, many more. Uh, they should help us to achieve these goals on a local as well as a regional and global scale. Next one, please. So the, uh, now I want to uh, focus on a few challenges in detail. Uh, and the first is education, which is extremely important uh, to educate about the sea and marine resources um, and also the insights how to deal with that. Next one, please. So uh, if we take a, a project involving uh, research and education, uh, like one which had been uh, also, um, yeah, been active uh, at EPB for a couple of years, the game program, we can look at uh, benefits and challenges. So the benefits are collaboration, flexibility, communication between different nations, intercultural training, uh, local, including local knowledge and such, so a big benefit. Challenges are the costs of the program. If you have to fly students from one uh, place to another, it costs money. Uh, we have uh, a local acceptance if um, dealing with uh, 20 or 25 partners globally, need sustainable support, and all that had to be included in politics as well in the respective countries. So uh, we have to include that into the research strategies of each country and into the educational strategies. Now something unexpected happens like the COVID-19 pandemic. Next, please. In Bukharen, you have five minutes. Yes, okay. Uh, I, have to, I will speed up a little bit. <laughs> uh, challenge in education. And uh, now we have to deal with um, a different situation. So we moved everything uh, to online tools. So everybody is now um, communicating online. We have the symposium online and uh, we also um, teaching online. That means we need a new infrastructure for that. Uh, there will be additional costs by providing uh, students and teachers and so on with devices. Uh, we need more natural resources in the long run uh, and in the long run, this will also include uh, getting res resources from, from different uh, backgrounds. And uh, also uh, we have a, a high energy demand for that. So this will, will add to the ecological footprint of um, our construction. Next, please. So how does it work? Um, the goal will be um, to educate about the sea and marine resources, and uh, we need to have ocean-friendly choices. So um, the growing energy demand of servers and um, mobile uh, devices uh, nowadays uh, always adds to 10% um, of the world total electrical consumption. That's an um, estimation uh, I recently found. There might be other numbers, but um, Overall, it points to um, it points to the point that we have to uh, develop in clean energy on a global scale, and uh, also think about the sustainable use of devices and resources like recycling and cradle to cradle principle. So now the next one, and I would like you to uh, move a little bit uh, 
towards the end of the presentation. So we just uh, skip the next two because it will highlight. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, another very uh, brief uh, challenge I want to mean to mention. Uh, this is re research uh, comparability because uh, um, the scientists uh, have to acknowledge um, that patterns are different. And two approaches um, I briefly want to mention are the future Earth Coast approach, providing a global platform for international scientific collaboration, and uh, the Virtual Island Summit, uh, adding a global perspective on connectivity, connecting all the small islands and adding to discussion. And I uh, saw that also Indonesian uh, scientists had been, been involved uh, into the discussion into a great deal. So now um, you, if you uh, be able to, to move to the last two slides that we can keep the time. Is it possible to move forward in the presentation? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Can you go back one or two? Okay, yeah, okay. Um, I will briefly um, go through that, um, add a new uh, perspective. Uh, ne next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, another challenge is tourism. Uh, you will see a lot of details into um, this figure as well. Few benefits, a uh, few challenges, a lot of benefits, a lot of challenges. Um, and uh, all this had to, to be included in our decision making. Uh, tourism is an, another challenge uh, ex highlighting uh, the individual choices we have to make. We can probably uh, discuss that um, later in, in to the panel. Next one. Um, so um, overall, um, just um, going into detail on uh, education and research now, uh, we need to have uh, and include holistic views on the earth and, and ocean. And uh, therefore, actually, uh, my previous speaker, um, Chris, already highlighted uh, social capital and uh, the visualization uh, that we need to have. Uh, to come to solutions which are locally sustainable. And uh, the holistic views on earth and ocean are already included in the uh, um, perspectives of the people. Like uh, if you go uh, very close to Bogor, to Pilawan, Ratu, uh, we have the port of the uh, Queen of the Southern Ocean, which uh, in uh, induces um, the view of uh, the sea uh, as um, a source for respect and fear, power and caring. And uh, so people have a uh, holistic view on uh, the, the Earth coast uh, and their relationship. The same applies to the theory uh, of uh, um, Gaia or the Gaia hypothesis, uh, envisioning Mother Earth as, as a, uh, a global entity where uh, we have to um, intervene, uh, in, uh, interact with. Next, please. So uh, now to end this, um, we come back to complexity and uh, the relation to transdisciplinarity. Um, I took two, two elements uh, from the conceptual model after uh, Lang et al. Uh, 2012. Problem framing and um, team building uh, will be necessary uh, for co-creation of knowledge uh, and that then uh, integrate and applicate this co-created knowledge for solutions. There are mo many more details in this paper uh, I will not highlight, but if you add some two more, please go forward, yeah. We need to have the flexibility on scales and linking networks and uh, include novel part partners and crowdsourcing to uh, create uh, a local solution. That means envisioning a holistic approach and what had been mentioned as well, visualize the environment we want to have. 
So this is uh, um, going into the direction of design thinking. We need to think the environment uh, we want to sustainably uh, live in. We have to sustainably live in and then co-create uh, co a solution. So uh, I just highlighted one of the examples. Maybe, maybe we can uh, go further into that uh, into the discussion. Thank you, Bahatian. Thank you, vielen Dank, and uh, thank you, Buyuya, for moderating. Thank you so much, Bukaren. Uh, apology, uh, my apology for rushing the last minutes. <laughs> thank you so much for the uh, for the insights. I've also learned a lot from your your um, presentations, and not only the complexity can be found in the uh, in the landscapes and also in the seascape. And it's much, much interest also that you describe more in details how the intersubjective understandings, the perceptions of the people, like for individual, the family unit, and also like very much influence how can we take this kind of diverse of interests and perceptions among these actors in micro levels and also bring it into the macros, macroscopic level. So there's so many different uh, interrelations between the small uh, micro level and also macro, and you explain it uh, very well. Thank you so much for the inspiration. So we see now uh, more complexity in all of different landscape, in lands, uh, landscape and seascape too. Thank you, Bukaren. And now we move to uh, the next uh, panelist, the last but not least. Uh, Pak Thomas uh, Reuter. Uh, Pak Thomas. Pak Thomas is a professor. Hello, in, uh, selamat Hanu. sore di sana atau masih, walaupun masih pagi di sini di Jerman. Uh, di I'm sini sudah, very... sudah sore, Pak. Sudah sore, Pak. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know. So... <laughs> <laughs> I'm very honored uh, to, to be, have this opportunity to speak to you and I would like to thank uh, Ibu uh, or Prof, Prof Damayanti Ibu Kori and Ibu Yulia for inviting me and uh, they also uh, did choose the topic for, for today's talk and I must say they threw me into the deep end somewhat. Uh, and I got going to screen share now, may I? Yeah. Langsung saja, Pak. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Silakan. I'm going to screen share now. Yeah, tapi sebentar mungkin kita introduction dulu uh, short biography dari oh. Pak Thomas, ya? Yeah? Okay, please go ahead. <laughs> I'd like to introduce you just a little bit, Pak. <laughs> So, okay. Pat Thomas Ritter. Uh, Pat Thomas is also, I, I mean, I, I, I used to work also with Pat Thomas before. We, we were in the same editorial team for the books, uh, tra trilogy books on Indonesia facing climate change, yeah, Pat. Uh, Pat Thomas uh, uh, was a senior vice president of International Union of Anthropological Ethnological Sciences. Uh, and currently, you're a professor at Anu University, at, at uh, Anu University, ya, Pak, ya? in Anu, Melbourne, ya, Pak. And then no, no, you, no. Are, oh, you, you are, uh, yes, sorry, but here, <laughs> wrong time. So you are a professor in Melbourne University, apologize for that. And you are a senior expert advisor of IPDES. Uh, intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, and also uh, expert advisor for IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And you are a member of Board of Future Earth, member of Board of World Academy of Art and Science, and fellow of European Academy of Science. I think uh, we will learn uh, <laughs> also a lot from you, Pat, today. And how with uh, your, from Pat Thomas, we will learn more about how to build a new human ecology. Now, nah, to learn more about what is the new human ecology, uh, we, learn, we will learn from you, Pa. Silakan. <laughs> Floor is yours. Okay. All right. I'm sharing my screen now. Okay. Just a second. Okay. Now. Um. Okay, that should be working now, yeah? Can you see that? Can you see my screen, yeah? Okay, you can, all right. Now, I was thrown in the deep end uh, and uh, 
asked to speak about sacred knowledge, which is, of course, very difficult. Indeed, uh, as uh, Chuang Se said uh, 1,300 years ago uh, in, in China, uh, where the sacred is generally referred to as the Tao, and he, he said that those who speak those who speak don't know, and those who know don't speak. So how can I speak about it without speaking about it? I'll try. So, okay. Now, clearly today we face a major crisis of sustainability. The way we live is not sustainable. But even so, it's not an ecological problem, and it cannot be solved uh, with some kind of te technical fix. It is really a societal problem, and it requires a cultural solution. Um, now, um, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the cause of this problem is that the modern way of life that we have, and in particular the sort of laissez-faire or liberal or neoliberal capitalist system that we have, is not ecologically sustainable, nor is it socially sustainable. And I guess uh, that the solution is in, in some ways very simple because all human ecologies are cultural artifacts. We create them, which means we can also change them. Now I should say that a human ecology is the way we relate to nature, to the environment. It is our, our approach to survival within an ecological context. So we have today a, a contemporary worldview that perhaps stemmed from sort of Western modernity, scientific materialism and, you know, liberal indiv individualism, humanism, capitalism. You know, you have a lot of technological in innovation, industrial revolution and so on but it's become a global worldview. It's been exported, it's reached every part of the world. And one of the key features is a kind of a spiritual disorientation that lies at the very root of it. And I'm trying to uh, uh, get to that point in a somewhat roundabout way. Now, the one thing we need to understand that is that the fundamental principle of life is that all life forms are interdependent. They have evolved and continue to evolve together. And that means when we talk about sustainability, oh, we must ask what, who's sustaining whom, yeah? Who is supposed to sustain whom? And the answer is that we, everything is sustaining everything else. So there is a state of dynamic mutuality in a single system that has no boundary, no, no edge. It is a, a, a total system. There is no distinction between the human world and the natural world. The human world is the natural world. Our thoughts are the natural world. When we think, when we speak, it is the universe speaking yeah, through us. When we exist as humans, it's the hum universe that is doing it. Yeah? The universe is doing human beings, all right? So there's no boundary there. Nevertheless, I mentioned before uh, the social and ecological uh, lack of sustainability. And that's because from, we have a perspective also, we have a perspective. And from that perspective, there is a sort of, this our inter interdependence with others is first of all social, because it's human beings that we're most dependent upon, other human beings, and then the wider environment. So there's a sort of a near and a far end of interdependence. Now, with the advent of modernity, and science is a big part of that, you know, we have this sort, of, um, this sort of theology, because, you know, Western scientific thinking very much uh, came out of the Christian tradition, and the whole idea of the laws of nature, if you, you know, uh, in, the, in the early development of science, very much uh, sort of like a divine order, you know, of nature. But there's this sort of false assumptions that humans compete against other species and that we must dominate nature. And there's also this sort of false, uh, false understanding of Darwinism, which assumes that 
economic interactions are also based on this competition between human individuals, maximizing, you know, how to maximize their own profit. Now, this is a very destructive attitude, and it is not how society works or how nature works normally. It's a misconception. Uh, the reality is quite different. History shows, for example, that you, the human success story, our, our success as a species has been based on an unprecedented capacity and willingness to cooperate within evolving rules-based socio-cultural systems that very much resemble natural ecosystems. And why shouldn't they? We are all part of that ecosystem. And the rules of society are very sim similar. You have to compete in order to exist because we are mutually, uh, we, you have to cooperate. Yeah? That doesn't mean competition doesn't exist, but there are ways in which nature and society deal with competition uh, that, that, uh, um, that is quite different from, you know, the, the sort of brutal competition that naive Darwinism puts forward. In fact, what happens is diversification. Uh, in society, that happens through the division of labor and if also between countries, you know, in, in trade through the, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, what, what is generally called, you know, by Adam Smith, uh, first called a competitive advantage. So when nature is faced with competition, it just drives diversification and further interdependence. And in, in, in nature also you have Gauss's law, which, uh, which uh, means where also competition drives evolutionary, evolutionary diversification. So we must ask then why is our contemporary society so destructive? Why is it on the social level, for example, you, know, you see that now the eight richest individuals own as much as 50% the, or the lower fifty percent of humanity. Okay, so that means uh, you have this sort of brutal system of appropriation, where so many people are left out, and more and more uh, you can see the trend there. It's getting worse. This, these figures are uh, twenty sixteen. It's already now. Uh, it has worsened since then. The lines have crossed, and those are some of the people who own half the world. Okay, so that's the sort of the, um, the the sort of the what this kind of modern worldview has done, yeah, socially. This idea that we all have to compete, and if you fail, it's because you're weak. Okay, and it's you just you you only deserve to be poor. You deserve to die. Whatever, uh, if whether you are a human who is weak or you're a species that weak that is weaker than us. It's this whole idea of total dominance. Uh, and, and here we, uh, sorry, we have, um, um, actually the problem is I can't see the top of my screen. Don't know how to, how, what to do about that. Um, so this is about uh, water shortage, yeah, overuse of water. So I'm just sort of showing some of the destruction now in nature, because what I'm saying is, the system that we have, this way of life, is destroying society and ecosystems. It's socially and ecologically destructive. So this is about water. This is about soil de uh, degradation. And uh, this is about food insecurity. You see Indonesia, unfortunately, is one of the countries that uh, uh, is facing really high risks in, in, in the face of climate change. Okay, this is about biodiversity and you can see the decline of species uh, in the last uh, uh, 50 years and it's ex accelerating dramatically. Like it, in, in Europe now we've lost uh, something like two thirds of our insects just in a few years. Um, and because of that, birds, wildflowers, and so on, it just goes on and on and on. We, we are clearly in a destructive situation. Why? What we use exceeds the rate of renewal uh, of, of, of renewable resources. 
uh, there's a peaking of non-renewable resources. We de we're destroying the biosphere. Uh, there's a growing world population and also growing per capita consumption. So those are the drivers. So if you look at it, um, um, they're not causes, but they're drivers. So um, this, this situation, I mean, people talk about the Anthropocene, meaning that, you know, the, the geological age where human action is actually shaping uh, not just the biosphere, but even the, the physical systems of planet Earth, climate change, for example, yeah. But where did this Anthropocene really start? And then we, there we, we have to, we get closer to the causes. I'm slowly kind of approaching the question of what is causing all this. So it can be traced back. I mean, humans have always influenced their environment. We've always shaped landscapes. We saw before in some of the other talks how traditional people already did that. Now I took a kind of a step up 9,000 years ago in the Neolithic revolution uh, when you had sedentary farming. So, you know, when you farm, it has a higher impact than, you know, when you're a hunter-gatherer. But the real start of the trouble was the Industrial Revolution about 250 years ago. And even more traumatic, the post-war period, when you had this kind of the birth of a mass consumer society. So that's the real if you look at the curve, it, that's where the curve really takes off and it becomes exponential damage. So um, you might ask, is there any other species who's ever done anything like this to the world? And here it is, there's the culprit. There's a species, uh, it's the cyanobacteria that in the great oxidation event, many millions of years ago, uh, managed to destroy almost all life on Earth because it emitted a toxic gas, toxic to the life forms back then, and that gas is oxygen. We are, you know, the descendants of the survivors. Um, we, we, for, for us, oxygen is actually necessary to live, but there you have a species that actually managed it. So the humans aren't the first to cause trouble. The difference is though, it took cyanobacteria 200 million years to fill all the oxygen sinks on planet Earth. It only take, took us 200 years to uh, fill all the carbon sinks, the carbon dioxide uh, uh, sinks. So we, we are, we are, our destruction is happening a lot faster. So, I mean, we've always been burning things. It's part of our story, we like to, we like to, to uh, you know, we, the, in, the, the invention of fire, or the use of fire is part of our story. And in a way, we're still doing that. We're still combusting. We're burning uh, material and more and more. Uh, in the early time, of course, it, it didn't have much of an impact. Uh, it changed landscapes. For example, in Australia, where I've lived for a long time, indigenous people shaped the landscape. They wanted more savanna. So they had regular burning. Uh, uh, in order to have more game for hunting and so on. But what we're doing today is on a completely different scale. So um, we, we need clearly a transition back to sustainability. And you might ask us why is, and Greta Thunberg and the young generation are now saying, why is it not happening? Everybody knows what needs to happen. Why is it not happening? And usually the excuse uh, is that it's too complex. It's so complex. It means we need, we need systemic change. And sure enough, uh, there is immense complexity at the material level uh, because of the interconnected nature of these challenges. If you look at the SDG uh, uh, sort of uh, SDG, some of the research done by the International Science Council on interactions, you see there are hundreds and hundreds of interactions. There's, that's one thing. The other thing is the local specificity of the responses to the challenges. That means in every place, you have to find uh, a different solution. It's not the same solution everywhere. You can't dictate it from above. People have to find solutions wherever they are. 
And of course, there's social complexity because people have uh, different interests, different pers perspectives on things, different identities, histories, politics, and uh, the way they both cooperate and, and, and compete differs. Yeah? So different, different realities. And then, you know, there's the usual idea of, of solution. This one is from the European Environment Ag uh, uh, Agency. We still see these sort of ideas of extraction, waste. These terms are completely wrong. You know, we shouldn't think of extra uh, an extractivist way of operating. We shouldn't think of anything as waste. So it's still kind of an old kind of technical model. Um, and, you know, then there are the, the economists who say, well, we have had these cycles of innovation, uh, contradictive uh, curve uh, or contradictive waves. I'll show you a diagram in a second. So that's sort of saying that, well, every time we, you know, things are just not working anymore, we come up with another technological breakthrough. And don't worry, the next breakthrough is going to be, or the next paradigm shift, uh, is going to be a sustainable economy, circular economy or whatever you call it. But it's a sort of a superficial view that the economists have. If you compare to say Michel Foucault's idea of an episteme or Thomas Kuhn's idea of a paradigm, paradigm shift, it's really very, very complex. It's really a whole society shift that is needed, not just an economic shift. There are those contradictive curves, and you see the the sort of the the the, the, uh, the, the, the they're now talking about the sixth wave being um, uh, sustainable sustainable uh, economics. Uh, okay, so there's this hope for a great leap forward, uh, driven by you know smart investors. And it's not wrong. If you look, I mean, I've, I've worked in, in, in with the financial industry. I had a meeting at the uh, UN in New York and the World Bank last year with bankers, trying to convince them uh, with a group of people from the World Academy that they needed to shift their investments. And it's really happening. There is a lot happening there. A lot of divestment from fossil fuels and a lot of money flowing into renewables. If you've invested in that, you've made a 50% profit in the last six months, okay? So it's really, something's happening in the background, you know, it's not all bad news, but anyway, um, the experience shows that really, if you look at um, technology, if it serves creed, and it does tend to serve creed, it's not the solution, it's the very root of the problem. And as Albert Einstein said, you can't solve a problem with the same way of mode of thinking that created it. So I don't believe in technological wonderlands. I don't believe those promises. Sure, we need different energy sources and so on, but it's not going to uh, sort of, you know, characteristic of modernity. There you have the sort of idea of the great progression forward, you know, and we end up in space and, you know, but in reality, we, we stand at the ed edge of ruin now, you know, following this industrialist uh, mentality. And you can see how, how cray it is. There's no room there for nature anyway. The problem is that if you look at Schumpeter and, you know, uh, and other eco economists, you know, talking about cycles and trying to understand the big picture, um, they forget completely that they're already, already most of, 99% uh, of human history, we have lived in a sustainable manner. And that local and indigenous peoples in much of the world still live in a sustainable manner. They completely forget that. So it's actually the future, but they talk about it as a potential future, but it's actually also uh, accounts for most of our past and our present. So those skills of living sustainably are actually displaced by the industrialist model of, of, of modern life. You know? And what is left of them is, uh, uh, is found in pockets of so-called underdevelopment, where, you know, uh, you know, the, the story is that, well, they need in technocratic intervention, they need aid, they need development, okay? 
And that development model has actually pushed a lot of the, uh, the, the so-called global south uh, towards the same problems or contributing to the same problems that the West has started to create earlier. Now here is the, uh, an image from the Human Development Index. Uh, Indonesia is somewhere on the, on the right, uh, so maybe one quarter from the right. The printing is a bit, the print is too small to read it very well. Uh, that's a global footprint, environmental footprint. So the further you are to the right, the more sustainable you are. And Indonesia is actually still fairly sustainable as it is now. Because that's because per capita consumption is so much lower in terms of energy than it is in Europe. That doesn't apply to the Indonesian middle class who is fast catching up. And so is the middle class in China and many other countries. Everybody wants an air conditioner and so on and so forth. And of course, eventually um, you have this sort of trend as development happens, country, you know, as a country is developed, it will become less sustainable. That just shows the madness of this whole system. Yeah. And here's a, a sort of a, a distribution of, you know, the technological wonderland effect. Okay. And you can see how all the development, uh, developed countries are in that top right uh, pocket of very high human development. But the more, the more developed they are, the less sustainable they are. So it's a clear correlation. So the development model that's being exported still is not working. Okay. So that corner on the in the bottom right, which is that's where you're supposed to be. I think the country currently closest to that is Costa Rica, because they have high development in a human sense. So they have, you know, people have a pretty good life, but it's also sustainable. Have a look at Costa Rica and see what they're doing. It's very interesting. I can't go into it in detail, but they have a very different idea. Now there are some economists um, uh, that, that also have started to uh, uh, sort of argue that small may be beautiful. Um, and even in, in the uh, FAO, uh, my, my personal research is on, on food and food security. We're now s finding that, you know, if, if you look at fisheries, for example, and I'm sure Karen will, 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 <laughs> will know about this, um, you can see that small scale fisheries have actually much lower or traditional fisheries have a much lower impact on the environment. They consume less uh, fuel. Uh, they have, there's less damage through bycatch and so on and so forth. And uh, so small scale uh, fisheries tend to be much more sustainable. The same is true of agriculture as well. You find that two thirds of the food is grown by small farmers on, on, on one third of the land. And not only that, the food they grow is actually the food you need to eat and the food that's grown by the, the large industrial operations is, is tends to be sugar and sugary and um, oil um, crops. So really things you should, shouldn't be eating. So it, it all shows that, you know, somewhere there we've, we, we kind of, and the economy and, you know, look, if you look at the global food industry, you see how it's still centralizing and how it's still trying to eat up all those small operators, all the small farms, the small fisheries, and that trend must be stopped. So what, what are we going to do? I mean, what's the future going to look like? Perhaps some mixture of traditional approaches and modern approaches. You know, there's, for example, permaculture is a good example of how that might look. It's a possibility. Um, clearly, I think we, there's so much we can learn from traditional uh, uh, ways of doing things, of, of, of being with, with the environment. This is from Bali, where I did my PhD research up in the mountains. Uh, you know, people where people really were living very sustainably still. Beautiful landscapes that have been 
shaped by human beings for, for thousands of years and still could keep going for many more thousands of years quite quite without any problem yeah but now if you go to the highlands it's all just a, a monoculture of citrus fruit and their extremely biodiverse gardens have disappeared so you see you know wherever development happens it tends to be like that so what do we need what do we need to do we need to change human behavior um, there has to be cooperation cooperation has to be celebrated again rather than uh, competition we have to consume less uh, we have to forget our obsession with economic growth and we have to change our mode of production uh, i think all that is fairly, fairly clear i don't want to go into the details but the problem is uh, these are all sensible suggestions that you hear a lot. But again, why isn't it happening? And I think it's about motivation. Okay. Motivation. What would motivate you to care about nature when you're just here for 70 years or so and then you die and it doesn't matter, okay? So why not just maximize your own pleasure and enjoyment and power and, and uh, um, take what you can get and uh, never mind about your fellow human beings, never mind about nature. So why should, you, why should you not simply ruthlessly pursue your own interests? That's the question. And um, the thing is, that's often forgotten, and now I'm finally going to get to my topic, that is that all the sustainable economies that have prevailed through much of our history and are still prevailing among local indigenous people is that they're based on spiritual traditions. There is a worldview at the root of their, uh, these system, these social systems that makes them sustainable. There's a certain relationship to the world that is fundamental. Now, where does that come from? You know, it's not, we're not talking here about a scientific knowledge. You can say, you can look at what indigenous people do and say, well, that's really quite sensible. It's very intelligent, it's smart, it's rational in a sort of ecological sense, yeah, because it's sustainable. But that's not really the way uh, people think. They the, the, thing, the, the way they think is that they, they feel connected. They feel connected to their fellow human beings through things like uh, religious ritual, community, uh, communal eating and things like that, sharing, working together. So they have a sense of connection yeah, to other humans, to the ancestors, for example, in Indonesia, uh, very, very important, you know, the cultivating a relationship to the ancestors uh, in many Indonesian uh, indigenous communities. So when you talk about sacred knowledge, really it's about an, an experience of connectedness and you cannot, science cannot provide that, but science can show us that we really are connected. It's not some kind of faith. It's not some kind of belief. It's a fact that we are connected, but we also must feel it. We must experience it. And I'll talk just a little bit about what religious experience really is. There's a new branch of science called neurotheology, which has actually shown that religious experiences are clearly distinct events in the human brain that are different from any kind of other state. And they are, you can very clearly show and characterize them in terms of what happens neurologically. So it's not people imagining things. There's really something happening that can be proven now, okay? That's, that's progress. Uh, and what people experience, if you look at the reports, um, it, it really turns some of the things that science has described in the language of mathematics into a direct personal experience. For example, uh, Unless we Einstein's- have seven minutes I, left. Seven that'll minutes. be fine. 
<laughs> Einstein's uh, discovery of E equals MC square, you know, the, the idea that we live in a four dimensional universe. A lot of people who have spiritual experiences describe that, whether they're shamans or, or uh, uh, practitioners of yoga or, or Taoist uh, uh, practitioners, they all describe that sense where, uh, they, where they are, they experience themselves as part of an eternity yeah, of a great united whole that is eternal, where there is neither a center nor a periphery. So that's very typical. So in a way that matches what science tells us, but it, it's different. It's different when you feel it, it's life changing. You can learn about uh, quantum physics in school and it makes no difference to you at all, okay? And that's because, you know, what, what really makes a difference is this naive Darwinism that we carry around, this idea that, oh, well, we are, um, we have, uh, 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 it's just a, 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 life is a battle. It's a, 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 you know, man is a wolf upon man, as Hobbes called it. Um, and the idea that, you know, it's a, just a brutal battle for survival, that's just not the way it, it is. But science has been interpreted in this sort of negative way. Now about religious experience, but it's been studied, of course, in psychology. Uh, people like William James started this, this empirical study of uh, spiritual experience. And uh, he found that what happens is that some people have these experiences and then you get orthodoxies. That's a natural process. So you know, you have prophets, you have people who have these experiences, and then it becomes codified, and it becomes a tradition. It can be part of the problem. It needn't be, but it often is. Okay. Max Weber said the same thing. He talked about the institutionalization of charisma. So you have a, a, a person, you know, who is somehow... Uh, has been able to, to broaden their consciousness through a spiritual practice or experience. And then their followers eventually create an organization, they create a church, uh, and you have offices and hierarchies that carry on that charisma, but that it's not the same as it was originally. Um, and in a way, that's that's kind of normal, a normal process. Durkheim said that, uh, you know, basically through religion, you have a, this sort of sense of a moral community. Um, and that our experience of God is really our social embeddedness. Okay. Uh, similarly, um, Clifford Geertz, another famous thinker in hermeneutics, he thought that, um, you know, we are animals suspended in webs of significance that we ourselves have created. Okay, so we will live in a world of meaning, not just in a direct experience of things, but what matters is what, what meaning we attribute it to it. And religion is very important in that regard in giving meaning to what we do and direction. So my own research on these topics has shown some worldwide trends uh, whereby a, a lot of young people are looking for direct experiences of the sacred. They don't want some kind of orthodoxy, but they want to feel a, di a, di a direct connection. And I think that's a deeply felt need because the narratives, the orthodoxies that we have can no longer uh, guide us. First of all, because they've been undermined by science they're no longer credible, uh, and also because they're rigid, yeah, but not that rigid. You, I've also discovered that a lot of the orthodox religious traditions uh, are actually turning green. Yeah? They're, they're becoming more ecologically aware. Uh, think of the Pope's uh, Laudatio Si uh, a, a statement yeah, about that, uh, that we need uh, to um, be stewards of, of the planet and protectors of nature. Think of the uh, Pesantron that are eco Pesantron now. And, you know, I've, I've seen a, a lot of uh, um, 
evidence for a shift in the in the in the great traditions but there's also a need to to kind of find new inspiration and new connection of course that kind of quest has a long history in indonesia uh, where you have concepts like nirvana right? acceptance yeah? uh, a sort of a sitting with the with the, the reality that we experience in the present or some samadhi uh, which is meditation or the concept of manungal manungal means to uni to become one yeah tungal uh with everything so this kind of uh, quest is 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 really quite ancient and from that position of course you're going to act in a way that's cooperative that is sustainable that is respectful towards nature because we look at it as sacred thank you thank you so much patamas also it's it's quite an insightful uh, presentations um that's uh, is a lot of thing uh, uh like uh, for instance made me think more about what is actually kind of innovations that uh, we need to sustain, you know, uh, to, to produce this sustainable world. Like uh, Chris explained about this really different type of high tech, which is totally different than the one that we uh, perceive as what is the high tech. And um, your presentation so invite us also to go deeper that connectedness is not something only that we know, but you have also to sense it. And in uh, uh, Buddha Mayanti words like connections between the mind and the heart. So connectedness also you have to, to feel it. And through this kind of uh, sacred knowledge, I think we can feel that kind of system thinking, complexity and connectedness and how to feel that in within us and internalizing within us okay thank you so much there is a lot of inspirations and we start uh, uh, having a lot of questions now uh, if you if, if if i may that i will also read some of the questions that posed to the panelists okay the first questions first questions uh, from parilus Pak Rilus, as to all panelists. Um, oh, oh no, Pak Rilus, as to uh, Ibu Mirza. Ibu Mirza, apakah ada riset yang menunjukkan bahwa semakin rasional manusia semakin tak harmonis hubungan antar manusia dengan hewan termasuk reptil? Uh, we'll translate it. Is there any research that shows that the more rational we are and less harmony that we 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 are with the animals the questions to ibu mirza shall i read it uh, all of the questions and then uh, i will let uh, uh, later uh, all the panelists to answer all the questions or one by one mm. i would say one by one because one by yeah, one. Think... one by one because otherwise okay. we lost <laughs> <laughs> okay then ibu mirza silahkan Ya, terima kasih banyak Ibu uh, Yulia. Uh, terima kasih Pak Arilus. Thank you very much uh, Pak Arilus for the the question. This is a really interesting question because when you say rational, what what do you mean by rational? Do you think do you mean that the modern people that we live is rational because sometimes uh, we are not much as rational as the one that working as the, uh, in, in traditional way uh, or you know the indigenous uh, people. So it's, it's difficult uh, to to think about what what do you mean when you say that when we are more rational we probably more not connected uh, with with wildlife. But there is a lot of papers that uh, are looking at how traditional uh, knowledge is is lost uh, in uh, the more contemporary uh, uh, life, and it is because several reasons and and some of the reason cited is uh, actually uh, because uh, the, the difference of the education education system uh, and also uh, the difference of uh, how people elected uh, uh, you know leaders uh, which change uh, the way how traditional uh, uh, knowledge is passed 
uh, uh, through the generation and also how uh, individual leadership of uh, the elders is uh, bypassed because of the new way of, you know, Pomilu and other things. Uh, so yes, I think because culture is never static. I mean, it's always dynamic and, and, and somehow uh, because people always adapt with a new way of life. And I think uh, all the uh, 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 all the presenters, uh, Professor Thomas, our uh, Dr. Karen, our uh, Dr. Christopher has already mentioned about how we live now that is uh, more on the, the material things. And uh, there's a, that's made this uh, possible for, for the change of, uh, traditional knowledge, and I think uh, that's <clears throat> the thing that we we, we need to uh, account of. Uh, that, uh, in fact, I was really astounded when uh, Professor Chris uh, mentioned because some of the things that we we think is just like okay, it's just like what we call in Indonesia biasa saja begitu ya, but it's actually high tech, uh, and uh, this this knowledge is doesn't really. Uh, pass into the the, the formal uh, education like uh, in an SD SNP we really learn by by rote and uh, all the modernized thing and then kind of like forgot uh, how uh, life in traditional way uh, for people that live in urban setting uh, like in the cities uh, well uh, things happen we kind of like lost touch with with the nature but uh, we must understand that uh, in Indonesia, probably there's only like 20 or 30 percent people living in cities and mostly is in, in, in Desa. Uh, and I think, as I think Budami somewhere mentioned in, in the chat that we need to think about how we, we think about the education system uh, uh, to make sure that we incorporate things like that. I think at least that's my my things on on your question, uh, Parilus. Okay, if I may comment on the question, uh, I think um, uh, it reminds me of um, one of my most favorite pieces of social so, social science writing by uh, Horkheimer and Adorno um, about uh, the. Um, dialectic of the enlightenment it's about the, the the birth of science which initially was based on reason which meant a total commitment to the truth total commitment to truth but it became instrument instrumentalized rationality yeah. a reason in the service of creed and self-serving you know self-serving motives was uh using knowledge just to uh, maximize profit, to maximize power, domination, and that kind of uh, destroyed the real essence of the initial movement of science of the so-called enlightenment or the Renaissance. So in, in a way, you know, that something went wrong there in the development of modernity in the whole trajectory, something that was lost with terrible consequences. And what was lost was a more holistic understanding of, of reason or rationality as serving, you know, the apprehension of truth. And that's not different from uh, spiritual, uh, the spiritual quest, really. And it was a spiritual quest at the beginning, but that part was lost. You see, that's, I think, why it went wrong. Hey. Thank you, Pak Thomas, for your additional comments. Thank you. Uh, if anybody would like also to add from Bukaren or uh, yeah. from uh, Pak Chris, anybody would uh, like to add to that? Um, I, I'm going to ask for something that's impossible. <laughs> and it's, uh, this, it's during discussions like this that I, I desperately, uh, in fact, it recalls uh, Ibu Mirza's uh, statement, uh, the problem how we lose touch with nature. But we lose touch with people. We lose touch with local people. I mean, even I have had the audacity to speak on behalf of local people and local knowledge. I mean, I like to think I'm right, 
so do you, Thomas, and so do you, Karen, and so do you, Mirna. But nonetheless, uh, this is my impossible. Maybe it's something CTSS could, could bring about. At a discussion like we're having now, somehow bring into the discussion ordinary people, uh, people who are uh, of different backgrounds out there in the villages and so on and so forth, to, to ask them to react to what we're saying. Uh, there's a lot of commonality between the presentations. There are differences too. And it would be, it would be wonderful. It's, it's a kind of impian, it's a dream. If we could uh, get the voice from ordinary people, people who are not academics like ourselves, to what is being said here, to what is being suggested here. I think that there'd be a lot of excitement, but there would also perhaps be some pushback as well that we could all learn from. So, uh, and of course, you can't have thousands of people here. You can't even have thousands of people online because they're not connected to us uh, in the villages. So uh, I desperately want to hear the voice of the people, uh, of, of the poor, of the villagers, of the local people, uh, be they traditionalists, uh, modern agriculturalists, or Rimba forest people, whoever they are. And I know it's, it's a hopeless wish, but I just put it out there for a future event when there might be the opportunity for those out there in rural settings to react to what, to, to, to what we're setting. And Thank stand you. back. And stand back. Uh, I think uh, what you uh, emphasize is representations matters, Yepa. Well, it, it's all part of this, what, what Thomas was talking about is that, with that um, we really can, I am actually pro probably more, more optimistic than Thomas is. You probably picked that up, yeah? Uh, I think we can cooperate. If, if, if there are the platforms, uh, if, we, if, we, if we seek to exchange information rather than do what I do, what Thomas does, and that's to preach, you know, Where, whereby we're all at the same level. It's very difficult to think how you do that. Uh, it's just not practical. Uh, at least when you have a large audience and you're online as well. But, but, I, but, but uh, I feel that voice uh, of ordinary people reacting to us is, is something that somehow I'd love uh, to see happen somehow. And I'm not sure how to do it. Uh, but I think that uh, fundamentally, we, given the opportunity, given the platform, we can have this discussion uh, not just with the big industrialists, but uh, also with the villagers. I want to hear the yeah. voice from the villagers. It was such a dulia. Budami, you already uh, taken a note of the Terry City SS. You would like to? Yes. yes. <laughs> Our agenda in the future. <laughs> Yeah. We'll remember. <laughs> we will all remember. Everybody here will remember. That's the agenda. Yes, yes. Again, not that. Oh, you're here. I just whisper actually. Terima kasih banyak. Lanjut lagi. Lanjut pertanyaannya. Ya ini tapi. It seems that it's more like it, it's this type of exchanges is more rich. Yeah, rather than like just one way. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Question and answer. Question and answer. Also, if anybody, all the panelists would like to add or would like to maybe <laughs> criticize anything, I think it's more like lively doing this way. Okay, so I uh, move to the next questions. Yes. Okay, next questions. Uh, for Ibu Miki, uh, do you see that biocardial diversity can be used to overcome the complexity of the battles in conservation, particularly the Komodo, which is now a hot topic? Your presentation is just at the right time where Komodo is a hot topic right now due to the development <coughs> issues. What is your view on this? Can transdisciplinary approach help us in overcoming the complexity of the issues? Silahkan. Okay, thank you. Is that from Professor Dami? <laughs> Well, let me thank you very much because uh, actually you did make me learn a lot uh, for this uh, conference uh, because I'm doing mostly uh, what I said before uh, as a classical biologist, but I didn't realize that some of the things that I really feel that 
and so do more on the the human side is actually part of the uh, biocultural uh, diversity uh, but uh, i learned a lot uh, doing the research in, in uh, Komodo. So I'm not really doing the research myself, uh, but for the past four years, I've been uh, have a partnership with Komodo Survival Program uh, in Komodo. And uh, there's, a, a, well, we can say that they're a young NGO more on the scientific uh, side. And uh, I think uh, we can say that uh, they are the people in the Komodo Survival Program is one of the, the people that really understand uh, the biology, ecology, and also the psychology of the, the people. And for the, four, the past four uh, years, uh, I've been sending my students, sometimes I go to Komodo myself, and we are doing a set of uh, uh, research. And when you, you say that can transdisciplinary uh, uh, be used uh, for uh, uh, the battle between conservation, of course, uh, I've seen it, how it is in, in the world. And I think uh, because we have uh, several human wildlife uh, conflict, not only Komodo, but also uh, the elephant and the tigers uh, and snakes. Uh, there's like early June, uh, January, there's always like snake coming in the urban area and there's a lot of uproar. People doesn't really understand that snakes part of the, uh, the urban uh, uh, habitat. So we, uh, I think we couldn't really focus on, on the animal itself. We really need also to focus on, on, on the human. Uh, and especially when uh, we talk about uh, the conflict between uh, human and wildlife in the setting that uh, there is already people living in, in the area. Uh, so the, the problem between uh, human wildlife conflicts differs between communities and taxon, but in terms of uh, uh, Komodo, uh, well, it, it also de depends as I uh, look before, it, it depends on, on, on the, the community that live in, in uh, Komodo, within the Komodo National Park. And uh, actually, uh, just yesterday, uh, uh, several students uh, of mine uh, from Faculty of Forestry uh, contact me and asking me about uh, the issue of uh, Komodo. I've been really trying not to really comment much uh, about what happened because the way that I see it, you, you, you talk about the uproar that happened now. Uh, it seems like there's also a bias uh, between what's really happening and what's behind it. Because when they are, uh, well, people are angry uh, because of the development the, the national parks are doing, uh, I'm not because what they do is mostly renovation. Uh, it's already there. The, the cafeteria, the housing of the, uh, and the Dharmaga is already there but they upgraded it. So they don't, they don't really, uh, uh, they don't really develop uh, something that's never been developed and then suddenly they, they make some things. They, they are not. But there's other issue as well because of the development of uh, the Labuan Bajo and uh, the area surrounded it, including the National Park for the, uh, uh, for the uh, tourism, because I think this is one of the, what is it, for President Jokowi uh, put aside some of the area that is really going to uh, uh, increase the, uh, the tourism. Uh, and the way that I see it, some of the, the people that's really commenting uh, negatively is people not really living in the Komodo National Park. So when I ask my, my students, uh, where do they, uh, they read the news and look who is commenting. Is there any people from the Rinja Island and also from Komodo Island? Uh, and there's actually none. I mean, I only found one newspaper that's really trying to, to balance and asking the, the scientists from the Komodo National Park and Lipi uh, plus asking people from Rinja, but the other is not. Uh, everyone saying like in the television, you know, uh, this is uh, the scientists from 
uh, yayasan something which I never heard before. Uh, so sorry about it. So I don't think it is really good. But the thing is like, as mentioned before by, by Chris, they never really talk with the with uh, the, the people that live in in that uh, village because you have to remember also that that village even though that it is within the national park it's kind of like you have to walk like one hour to the uh, to the village with uh, uh, in the if to see the 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 real the the what is it the daerah inti dari komodo nya jadi so it's a bit a bit far away and people are kind of like thinking <laughs> they are really living together but Rincha and Komodo is quite fast you know <laughs> cukup luas jadi mereka tidak upruk-uprok bikin begitu okay. what i'm worried about is when they have thinking that uh, we need to make the Komodo island or the Rincha island sterile of people except people that pay for it so it means that they have to remove the island, uh, the, the villages. I'm against it. But if you say that they kind of like the floppy, I'm not really worried about the, the Komodo in the national park because if anything happens, the whole world will be uh, angry. Uh, what I'm worried is the, the Komodo in, uh, in Flores Island actually, because nobody really look at it. Not really, really care about it. There only a small population left, and 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 they really live uh, okay. in areas that uh, probably <laughs> uh, threatened because now they are also making the 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 apa jalan raya uh, yeah. near the, the coastal area okay. from Labuan <laughs> Bajo uh, to the eastern part, and nobody really look at it. So mm. I think uh, uh, Professor Davi, we we really need. To, to look at uh, to look really closely about the the the, the case of uh, Komodo is a big uprono, but some of the comments is just like you know you know okay. the Indonesian <laughs> <laughs> understood Ibu. I kindly uh, gently remind everybody that we still have so many questions to go. <laughs> so okay, if, just stop. If you'd like, <laughs> if you'd like to respond. <laughs> Please uh, make it succinct because we still have so many questions to go. Uh, sudah bu, kita lanjut lagi. Ada atau ada tanggapan dulu? <laughs> kita lanjut that, lagi. It's fine. Oh, okay. Yeah. Please do. Okay. So, so let's go. Uh, let's continue. Uh, wait. Now, next one is addressed to Pak Chris. Pak Chris. Question number one, uh, can I, um, uh, may I um, just read it in Bahasa Indonesia? You would like me to translate it into English, Pak Chris? Dalam Bahasa Indonesia saja. And then you can reply in, in English. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because I think we also have international uh, attendees here. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize the question. But anyway, please read it to me in, in Bahasa. Okay, terima kasih. I'll, I'll uh, nomor through. satu, uh, pertanyaannya yang pertama. Lokal teknologi seperti bambu tadi umumnya bersifat padat tenaga kerja, sedangkan modern teknologi umumnya lebih padat modal dan kapasitas yang lebih besar. Itu sebabnya ada kecenderungan orang lebih memilih modern teknologi. Mohon komentar Bapak untuk ini. Pertanyaan kedua, untuk lokal knowledge mengenai natural resource management seperti sasi, mulung, dan lain sebagainya, cenderung semakin pudar bahkan mati seiring perkembangan masyarakat yang makin modern dan berorientasi komersial. Mohon tanggapan Bapak dari Pak Rilus. Silahkan, Pak. Terima kasih. Um, uh, a very valid observation that the deployment and use of local knowledge, local uh, technology tends to be very labor intensive in comparison with the uh, modern capital intensive uh, systems, which are based on, well, they used to be based on machines. Now they're based on what we're using today. Uh, and, but they still are capital intensive uh, finance wise and so on and so forth. Uh, um, you know, what, what to do about this. And uh, the, the second one was uh, the concern that, that those who possess local knowledge 
uh, as they modernize, they lose that local knowledge. And, and let me be clear here, uh, very clear here that local knowledge can be uh, how to practice something technologically to control a pest or a disease of your crop. But also it can be how you can organize together through the use of social capital or trust. And, and that's certainly true. <clears throat> Uh, and again, that goes back to, to my point. It's a plea. It is a plea because it must come from uh, academics, uh, decision makers as well. Uh, please uh, uh, pl value local knowledge more uh, because uh, at some points in development, it really can contribute. It really can improve even uh, capital intensive uh, uh, knowledge. I give the example of engineering, um, uh, a hydrological engineering system inside the peatland. Local knowledge improved the design and the construction of that. Without that, they would have built useless uh, devices. And uh, to the credit of the engineers, they accept that they had, they, they had something to learn, but this happened really by chance. We were lucky. There were some rather extraordinary people who were proponents of local knowledge uh, on the government side who valued local knowledge and somehow it was magic. So uh, hence my earlier point, we need clearer roadmaps. Uh, we, we, all over the world, um, certainly in Indonesia, local knowledge is valued, but at a very high level, at a very high level. It's in the RPG Men Pulu Sampai Duaplumpat, in the National Development Plan for the next four years. It's there, but nobody knows how to make it work. And I think that we need to help. Maybe academics can help here. Is how to how to to help this local knowledge to be more valued by those who are building roads, bridges, uh, widgets, and midgets and digits. Uh, basically, because they, because uh, actually, even in a in a pure economic setting, they could do so in a more cost-effective way. They could come up with something which is indeed uh, more effective. I can't, we haven't got time to go into this, but certainly, twenty years ago, I was looking at crop protection, which was, by any economic measure, even the most rabid uh, neoclassical economist. Uh, in fact, I was working with one, agreed that the local technology of Tumpangsari intercropping was more cost effective to control disease of pepper and coffee, yeah, lada and coffee, than spraying on with pesticide. It was actually economically better. But of course, uh, the companies want to sell the pesticide. The researchers are being funded sometimes by the companies. I mean, it's complicated. Of course it is. So I guess my answer to both of these is, please, and, and it's a plea to academics, maybe, because people look to academics and researchers. Please help government, because they help them uh, as well to figure out how to better value local knowledge before we lose it. Because once it's lost, because it's tacit, it's not written down, yes, indeed, it's probably lost forever. So that's my answer to that, really, is it is a risk. There were two very good points by the questioner. And uh, please, uh, especially now as we try to rebuild after COVID, uh, please pay more attention to local knowledge about how people do things, but also how they organize together. Um, and, and bring the high level policy statements to something really pragmatic. Yeah. If I may okay. comment on that, just start very quick. <laughs> um, I wanted to say that I completely agree with this part, Chris. It's absolutely true. And there's a lot we can do as academics. I'll give you two examples of my own practice. I have a project on sustainable agriculture movement in Indonesia, farmers making change towards sustainability. So talking with local people is what I do. I really like doing that. But we have to bring it bring them to the table. So I've organized a workshop, uh, which will be at UGM, where I bring together the farmers that I work with who are practicing change, okay, making the uh, sustainability transformation. And I want to bring them together with academics, 
with uh, government representatives, right. NGOs, and uh, uh, businesses. And uh, so we can actually sit at the table together and speak, exchange experience. And the other thing is uh, at, the, at a global level, I'm working with a group of uh, colleagues on building a platform um, a bit related to what Ibu Yulia is doing at the moment uh, for the UN. And it's about solutions that people find at the local level to all kinds of sustainability issues. And we want to build this platform for exchange of that knowledge, peer-to-peer -peer exchange between local people. And then with science and NGOs and other people coming in and businesses and contributing as well. So that's, there, there are ways of doing that and it's very necessary. Taking a note. <laughs> I uh, saw that book, uh, Buddha Nisad, like already <laughs> thinking deeply. <laughs> I saw that. Okay, terima yeah. kasih. I think we've got a lot of uh, not only the content, but also to move forward. Yeah, but yeah, you see foresight already. <laughs> so we are discussing foresight. Uh, okay. Uh, may I continue? Yes. Yeah? Go. Yes. Okay. Now this this time is for Ibu Karen. Ibu Karen, since the sea is a kind of common resource, a fish is common pool resource. It is more complex and difficult to manage, and thus there is a tendency that the tragedy of the common takes place. What is your comment? Dari Palelus ya. Silakan Ibu Karen. Thank you very much for this question. This is. Uh, um, interesting and uh, also very uh, this is a very basic problem so of course you can address that as a tragedy of the commons um, because it's, it's hard to control um, it's hard to assess uh, what's already there um, that's the um, um, task of all the, the, the policies on local level and uh, on the governmental level but uh, you can also see it the other way around. So we have a lot of uh, screen switching and sharing and uh, mirroring today. Um, actually, you can, um, since we are awake now as societies, you can address that also as a responsibility of the commons. So now we, we know that, or actually to, to go with the previous speakers, we, we know what we don't know. Uh, and uh, we have a slight idea about the resources and also the endangerment. So if you switch that around, then the tragedy of the commons can be um, developed in the responsibility of the commons. So not every person on the, on the uh, individual level is, is aware of uh, um, the, um, the local resources or the global resources. But uh, this will be our task now to um, raise the awareness and also to involve people. And uh, a comment to the, the previous um, discussion. Uh, one way to do that, um, which have been probably already mentioned, is policy briefs to bring, uh, include the local knowledge, uh, bring that to the policy level, uh, and then um, level that down to the management level that everybody has a, uh, at least as a chance to be involved in that. So this is increasing now. I think uh, every major organization has uh, an own uh, group of people dealing with policy brief development and informing management and government, uh, which had been uh, long neglected in the last decades, uh, but now it's happening, <laughs> thankfully. And uh, also the, um, um, a lot of people also uh, mentioned already, also uh, Budami um, asked how we can continue all this discussion. So probably uh, all the round tables taking place uh, is another way to do it. So what we do now, uh, we can also do uh, in a, another kind of uh, round table continuation in involving questions of local people. Because uh, that also one of my experience, I, I talked with citizens from different countries and different levels. Um, starting from fishermen or um, people in public education or tourists. And uh, they raise very, very interesting questions not raised by the scientists. 
So actually, we we should listen more and learn from that and, uh, and change our, our way to question things. So I also learned uh, a lot from these discussions and uh, so probably uh, all uh, things which had been mentioned by uh, by the other speakers should be um, yeah, continued in a joint discussion. Thank you so much, Ibu. Yeah, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, inputs and insights also for CTSS, yeah. <laughs> so this is not clearly, I think, I think I've got a sense that everybody agreed this is not the end. This is only the beginning and we need to explore further together. And I have a sense, strong sense of, uh, of uh, doing that together. So yeah, and, uh, maybe that the Ibu Dami can take it forward after this and make it like more very concrete uh, plane. Uh, where we can in also involve the roundtable discussions that also inviting the grassroots people with you too. I think uh, the Future Earth uh, the organizations Papa Mazis is a board with, I think doing a lot of transdisciplinarity and also uh, you make a difference between transdisciplinarity and citizen science. So I mean like how the the knowledge and the science from the local people can be also included in the co-creations of knowledge. Okay, terima kasih, Ibu Karen. Uh, shall I move to the next question? Okay, berikutnya. Uh, untuk Pak Chris sekarang, <laughs> untuk Pak Chris, uh, dari, dari Budami, I like the fact that you touch the pragmatic roadmap for integrations uh, ELCA, uh, indigenous knowledge into modern research and development. I would like to link this to Bulasmi presentation earlier on transdisciplinarity being both scholarly and activism approach. Do you see the link between this roadmap that is needed and the two characters of transdisciplinarity? Uh, should transdisciplinarity methodology covers both? Silahkan, Pak Chris. Well, Look, um, I'm sure the answer is yes, and I have to be honest. I, I unfortunately was not at the presentation earlier. No, I have to be honest. I, I just, uh, I had another halangan, yeah? I had a halangan, not another halangan. This is not a halangan. This is not a problem, yeah? But I have absolutely no doubt. Uh, if you see the connection, yes, it's certainly there. I, I, I think that to, to everyone, to all of us, whatever we do, no matter how, uh, uh, how enlightening it is when we uh, connect, we cooperate, we get different ideas. I, I really liked uh, uh, Karen's point uh, about how uh, you know, fishermen can come up, ordinary people can come up with ideas that academics never dream of. I'd like to add to that that villagers uh, all over the world can be very eloquent and are prepared to be very eloquent if they are given the opportunity. But... But uh, when it comes to the roadmap, we've just somehow got to make sure that at the end of the day, it gets translated into uh, policy, into uh, a pragmatic way to be used by those who are dealing with uh, the real world uh, problems where uh, there are clashes between traditional and modern systems and so forth. And, and we've, it's great that we produce policy briefs, fantastic. But we've got to make sure that those briefs result in, uh, in a kabijakan, in a policy, uh, which is sufficiently instructive so that people who are out there in the field are able to use this and figure it out. I mean, um, I go back to this wonderful uh, a discussion a week or so ago uh, facilitated by Trevon Boss. I, 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 I applaud what they did, uh, but their answer was, no, it's okay. It's all in the policies. Don't worry about it. Uh, and and it's not, that's not enough. It's great. We've got the enabling policies there. RPGMN, for example, Antara Line, the National Development Policy for Indonesia, explicitly mentions the importance of local knowledge and then leaves you at the end of a cliff. <laughs> oh yeah, well, what next, you see? And you have to have what we talk about in, in Indonesian, juklak, juknis, you, you, have to have, you have to give guidance to people who are uncomfortable uh, at, at the field level, particularly uh, 
the uh, bosses of small companies or even large companies and the functionaries out there in the field. How do they go about doing this? Uh, it's great that we, um, that we have these meetings and I hope we will through you, Ibu Dami and CTSS, but as you just said, uh, Ibu Julia, even that will be just a beginning. It's, it's not really the end, but, and even then it's not the end, until we have a policy, until we have a roadmap which shows people practically how to deal with this. You know, you know, of course, the answer, the criticism of what I've just said is, oh, it'll take forever if we talk to everybody. Well, that's patently not true. I mean, the, uh, I'm going to use a bit of Indonesian here. Uh, we have in Indonesia the expression socialisasi. And that basically means you're going to socialize to the villagers what you're going to do. You take half a day, you give them some envelopes, they sign a piece of paper, and you've done community participation. Well, no, you have not. If you do proper participation, free prior and informed consent, padiatapa, which is now accepted in Indonesia, it may take two months. That is true, and not half a day. But if you do the half day socialisasi, it's going to be meaningless, and you're going to have conflicts and keta and so forth all the way through the development of the the road, the factory, the mine, the oil palm plantation, call it what you like. If you do the padiatapa, the FPIC, which yes, takes two, two, two months, then you have rumongso melu handarbeni, then you have a sense of shared ownership. I'm very, I'm very concerned with the, the bridge between the, 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 the academic, if you will, uh, and, and, and really knowing more about what the right way is and, and actually making it practical, I guess, I guess is my answer to that. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a connection, Dami, to answer your question. Give me, give me one minute and I'll take 10 minutes to talk, won't I? I think Thomas is worth thinking. <laughs> yes. But basically, thank you, uh, thank you, I, I think that, but CTSS, no, no, uh, and if you will forgive me, Simon Muji Samantaria, if I can flatter all of you at CTSS for this kind of transdisciplinary dialogue, it's fantastic. Uh, but we mustn't just feel good about it. We must mm -hmm. treat it, as you said, uh, Ibu Yulia, as a beginning uh, and, and then think about next steps. So the next time we don't meet quite like this, but we meet in a way that carries us closer to mm -hmm. capturing to capturing the local values and the local knowledge, and perhaps, Thomas, to recapturing the, the spirituality, which is also being eroded over time as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. That's a lot of food of thought, Ma. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, I think uh, there's a lot of notes <laughs> for CTSS inside also. Okay, may I continue? I think yes. uh, I won't be able to answer all of the questions because we have a lot of questions. So I need now to pick uh, some of the questions. Forgive me in advance if some of the questions are not being posed now. Otherwise, due to the time constraints, this is also an indicator that we, we are very much engaged in this topic, so to speak. So that's the indicator that we, we really need to <laughs> follow up because I think everybody into it, the, our heart, our heart like uh, connected, <laughs> not only our intellect, but our heart also connected. I, I did, I can sense it. So uh, next, next one is from our MC, uh, Div Div Divine, uh, Divine, Divine Vijaya. Divine. 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 This is really lovely name, yeah? Divine. I'm a first graduate from the Department of Aquatics Product Technology yeah, from the university. Lovely name. I would like to ask questions to uh, Ibu Karen. How do we make sure that fisheries are sustainably managed? What role does the transdisciplinary approach take part in sustainable fisheries and seafood? Silahkan Ibu. Yeah, thank you for the question. That's pretty comprehensive and uh, probably that's also one of the major challenges. How do we make that happen? And um, probably uh, I'm not a fisheries uh, ecologist or a biologist. Um, there are many people also from IPB who are addressing this question. Uh, from my point of view, there are um, two perspectives. Uh, one C of the, uh, the uh, stock of um, the biomass and the fish. So what is in the oceans at first? 
uh, and uh, that actually we don't know for sure. There are good estimations, uh, there are even better estimations, but we do not know for sure how many fish exactly and uh, where this fish is distributed. Uh, so this is a stock assessment and uh, sustainable as a basis for the sustainable fisheries. And uh, the second uh, perspective is a policy. So we estimate or we, we know uh, we can estimate what is there. Therefore, we uh, estimate what we can sustainably catch on the other side. And then we have to uh, make it um, make a policy um, out, out of this to um, ensure that it's equally shared, that everybody can participate and so on. So these are two major perspectives. And in between is economy, individual politics, interests, and so on. So uh, actually, it's a combination uh, of all these factors. And uh, this is, a, um, yeah, as discussed, a complex system. So there's no uh, simple answer to that. So you have to take all these, um, perspe uh, these factors into account and involve uh, people from all disciplines and backgrounds, uh, including the ones which are the actual players. That means the fishermen, the middlemen, uh, the market players, uh, as well as uh, the communities controlling these, these local activities and markets. And then uh, we can come up with a solution how to, to do this sustainably. So very interesting question, no uh, simple solution from my part, uh, but this will be something to discuss further as well. So thanks again for this question. Thank, Thank you, you for the answer. I think the quotes from uh... Paulinus Apa, Lin, Li, Linus, Paulin, Pauling, Pauling, Linus Pauling said that the good idea is uh, a lot of ideas. <laughs> it contains a lot of ideas. It's a good idea. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> we need to gain more, more ideas, multiple perspective, multiple ideas. I think it's much better because to tackle the complexity, not with the linear approach here. But yeah. Okay, the next question. Thank you, Ibu. From Ibu Nefi. Spiritual traditions and sacred knowledge are interesting things in the context of sustainability. Society in Indonesia grows in religious nuances, wherein it is thought a causal order based on various past human experiences documented in various religions. Most of these religious book teachers teaches a harmonious relationship between humans and human, humans and nature, and humans and the creator. It is unfortunate that in this modern world, it is getting lost and not taught much in schools. Currently, schools are focused on science on how to reach high productivity, how to earn a lot of money, power, etc., which is all capitalism. Even in Indonesia, there is a trend for young people questioning the God. What do you think about this? Pak Thomas, silahkan. <laughs> well, I think uh, personally, um... Uh, the problem is that, you know, what I said earlier about this instrumentalization of reason and of science. And science, for example, tells us that, you know, matter equals energy, okay? You can transform a tiny amount of matter into a huge amount of energy because matter is ultimately just energy. But it doesn't tell us to build an atomic bomb, okay? That's got nothing to do with science. So really, uh, the quest for truth in science is no different from the quest in truth uh, in spirituality. It's, it's compatible because in both cases, there's a determination to know the truth as much as we can and to reach out for it and to settle for nothing else but the truth. And that's the same. It's not... A clash. The clash is when you have orthodoxies that insist on certain on a certain view of the world that that doesn't accord with science. For example, that human beings emerged five thousand years ago from Adam and Eve. But then, if you're a good scientist, you will turn around and say, "Well, what is this story then about about Adam and Eve?" And there's very good literature now on 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 talking about the sort of the fall from paradise in terms of the shift to agriculture, uh, that it really was a reflection, a, 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 uh, 
a, a story that reflected on this shift and how the paradisical condition of living with nature without ever having to cultivate was lost when people started farming. That's really what it is about. So it, it doesn't mean that, you know, it's all a whole lot of nonsense, okay? So you get these people in science who sort of, you know, who are atheists, who sort of like to uh, laugh about religion and dismiss it, but it's not appropriate. And if you look at the, 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 the cutting edge science, I mean, you know, um, sort of at least the last hundred years in physics, you know, you have more and more discoveries that are very much, uh, so if you listen to those physicists, you, you'd think they are mystics. And in fact, you know, people like Einstein, uh, you know, Einstein, I don't know whether you know, but had a long correspondence with his Rabindranath Tagore, the famous Indian poet and mystic, and uh, exchanging their views on the nature of reality, coming from very different directions, but finding a lot in common. Okay, so the people who are really true scientists and truly, truly spiritual uh, don't clash and they don't have that sort of arrogance of wanting to, you know, dismiss the other lightly. Okay, and so I think it can be and it must be united because the problem is that, you know, people uh, have this sort of uh, perception of science, for example, the idea of human evolution, that we are the, the descendants of uh, yeah, apes, yeah, Katurun and uh, Monyet. <laughs> and it's sort of, it's dismissive, dismissive of us, yeah, as human beings. And it's, it's, people are upset about that. But the truth of the matter is, really what it's, what evolutionary biology is showing us is that we are part of life, 100% part. This is our family. Okay. This is our family. We, we are one with that. We, you know, we know we share 98% of our genes with chimpanzees. We share 30, 40% of our DNA with plants, you know. So is that a terrible thing? I don't think so. You see, it's just how you look at it. So I think there needs to be a, 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 a sort of a a rediscovery of the true science that is just about truth and not profit. The kind of science that doesn't look at a forest, and just things, oh, that's about $20,000 worth of timber there. But says, oh, this is a complex ecosystem, you know, and there's so much more to learn, you know. If you look at the, the latest signs and how these ancient forests, how they are communication networks between the plants, through the mycelium of fungi, you start to think, wow, this is amazing, you know. They're actually talking to each other, you know. We now know that uh, mature trees can feed small trees in, 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 a, in a rainforest uh, that are their offspring. They can actually feed them so they survive until there's maybe uh, some trees uh, knocked down by wind and they can have light to grow but that can take a hundred years and they keep them alive during this time. We, we're discovering more and more of how nature works. And it's, uh, to me, it's uplifting. It's not uh, uh, sort of um, no reason to feel that as human beings, we're any less. Okay. Yeah. So in fact, yeah. it's amazing. So it's a, it's a great magical, mysterious uh, world we live in. And, and I don't think that as a scientist, uh, uh, you know, that mm. I don't have any problem with that perspective on things. Mm. Yeah. It's a sense of exploring, Eva. Yeah. Sense of exploring. Sense of wonder and humility. Sense of wonder. <laughs> yes, sense of wonder. True. That's what have we missed so far. I think sense of wonder. Agree. Uh, next question still to you, Eva, from Ibu Lasmi. Thank you for sharing this interesting idea of spiritual experience of unity with humanity and science. And how do you think this spiritual experience can be spread and internalized widely? <clears throat> For instance, can this be integrated into our education system? 
or is there any other way or institutionalizations that can be used as a medium for internalizing the need to have a spiritual experience of unity with humanity and nature? Because otherwise, it may become a matter of personal or particular encounters. Silahkan. Is that for me? Yeah, the question. Yeah, look, I think it's possible. Um, give one example. Uh, there's in the U US now a movement called Conscious Capital. And there are people who are actually looking at investment. And they, I mean, you know, fund managers, hedge fund managers, as a matter that requires a, 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 an upward shift in consciousness. So the, for, to them, the conscious investor is one who has moral responsibility, who thinks in terms of multiple stakeholders. Even the World Economic Forum in Davos now is proposing that we need a shift in, in the capitalist system towards this multi-stakeholder uh, model. That means system thinking, and that means moral and ethical thinking. So there is a realization that this is not some kind of fancy, preachy, religious thing, but it's actually essential for our survival. And it's actually how we have survived and continue to survive through cooperating. If we didn't cooperate, our, today, if we stopped, everything would collapse instantly. In fact, we cooperate amazingly well as human beings. It's incredible what we do. Okay, and it's a small minority who sort of looks at this society and says, well, how can I exploit as many people as possible and extract wealth from them, you know? It's a small minority who operate like, it's not who we are, it's not normal, okay? And it's destructive and you have this old problem, how do you control this minority who are willing to do anything to serve their own interest? It's an ancient problem, uh, the problem of power. Or, yeah, call it the problem of evil if you wish. But if you want to be, take the religious perspective, but in education, I think there is now a push, certainly UNESCO is now pushing to integrate sustainability thinking into education. There's a massive uh, push, but like Chris said, it's still at the top level and it will take some time to 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 sink down okay now since you are here i think i will still pose questions if, if it's okay for everybody if i continue or it's okay because so over the time so i ask uh, everybody's permissions to continue fine okay uh still for you pa uh, agree with uh, pa Thomas that the, uh if other panelists also would like to add or to jump into the discussion, feel free to do so. <laughs> so for you, Pa, I agree with Pa Thomas that technology will not answer societal problem on poverty and justice. However, that is how the majority of education is teaching the world. So one major problem is the educational system or curriculum given at schools. That is one point. The second point, is that we are now living in a world where wealth and power is saving the civilizations through using science and technology. It seems that social medias are creating zombie. And sadly, the middle class and the so-called intellectuals are part of this new generation of zombies. Wealth that is being accumulated at certain percentage of the society has been used by the few rich to create their future. For example, moving to Mars. I think it is time to make a social movement, but how? Uh, but Thomas invoked the importance of spiritual traditions and sacred knowledge, as did Bumiki and Ospakris. I'm thrilled that Pat Thomas is invoking neurology, neurotology, and quantum physics. We at CTSS is currently learning about quantum physics and there seems to be something in quantum physics and transdisciplinarity that seems to connect. Would like to hear comment from Pat Thomas on this. Have you any comment on David Bohm? Ah, Pak Hussein bakal senang nih. Have you any comment on David Bohm and his ideas on quantum physics? 
Long uh, questions from Buddha, please. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, you know, David Bohm, um, you know, like Einstein had his friendship with Rabindranath, Rabindranath Tagore. So Bohm also sought the company of people like Krishna Moti, you know, Eastern uh, spiritual thinkers. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, it's, it's, I think it's quite difficult to teach that sort of thing. It's, it's difficult. But um, uh, I think. What, what is important is that um, I think, uh, especially, uh, you know, with young children, it's, they need to, to, uh, to have time to, to explore and time to um, uh, develop their social skills, for example, their, their skills of working in a, in, in, a, in a team and to appreciate each other's uh, ability. And there's, it's, it's really sad that children are sort of pitted against each other in the education system, which is, you know, about performance and you, you, you've got to beat the others and be better than them and all that sort of thing. It's terrible. I mean, it's just uh, um, not necessary. So I think we should take some of the competition out of the education system, bring in more uh, uh, cooperation. But yes, well, I think um, coming back to Bohm, uh, David Bohm, it's it's really quite amazing. You know, he it, at the time he he was a little bit of a a, a, a marginal figure, but his uh, 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 his theories have become more uh, central now, and it's it's uh, basically uh i think what is emerging is that consciousness yeah consciousness is actually part of the fabric of reality uh, the observer is part of the making of reality and that's a very difficult thing to understand but but uh, it seems that the whole of 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 the universe is about information you know, if you look at the word information it's actually creating form and that all form contains information and in that sense consciousness yeah so it's not that human consciousness is some com some kind of thing that is separate and looks at the world as an object you know this subject object thing but it's actually the object itself is doing the work of being conscious yeah it's it's nature itself that is produced consciousness and it's intrinsic to its nature. I think Bohm was starting to, to unravel that on the basis of mathematics and, and uh, uh, empirical physics. And now more and more there's evidence to support that, that uh, claim. So, yeah. Terima kasih. Lengkap sekali ya, mulai dari David Bohm, quantum physics sampai Banyak sekali. So we have a lot of uh, things we, we've been discussing also in a complex uh, manners. <laughs> okay. Uh, next, uh, we have two uh, last questions. Is it okay if I read the two last questions? First is for Ibu Karen. Uh, Ibu Karen, uh, very high pressure on the oceans, both from anthropogenic activities such as pollution, land use change, marine debris, etc., as well as natural phenomena such as increasing temperatures, climate change, acidification, etc. How can our oceans survive in the future as a source of food security for an archipelago country like Indonesia? How can transdisciplinary approach can be implemented in such complex problem in the oceans? Thank you, Bunefi, for this question because it's raising, uh, summarizing all our problems. Um, and um, yeah, it, it's still a, a major challenge or, or a global problem. So we have so many different factors which we identified now. And uh, from my point of view, we should now move, uh, like many institutions already have, um, from the perspective of individual factors, which are investigated and need to be uh, further investigated um, to, to the global view, because the oceans cannot be um, per perceived as itself. They are connected to the earth. Most of the problems of the ocean come from land or from climate change. 
and uh, this, these are landmade or anthropogenic. And um, so we cannot solve a, a, a marine problem <clears throat> without um, looking at the coast, uh, the development of coast and policies and so on. So um, if we want to deal with acidification, uh, we have to deal uh, with human production, with rivers uh, and so on and so on. And um, bring all this to together. That's our task for the next decade, I think. <laughs> that summarizes very well what we will have to do. Um, for the individual policies, um, there are locally based solutions. For instance, uh, Indonesia made uh, big efforts in, in waste reduction and uh, dealing with plastics and so on. And uh, I just discussed that uh, from another perspective, uh, from the perspective of very small rivers in Germany and how to introduce these uh, topics to the public. It's actually um, the same questions raised in a different language, but uh, from the perspective of um, the individual uh, living in a village or uh, in a small town, it, it's quite the same actually. So we have to bring all these in, uh, into one, um, a global uh, approach. So we have to look at uh, the oceans of part of the earth and uh, the um, oceans are dealing with the problems caused uh, elsewhere. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we have to, to see if we have behavioral change or societal change, technological change, uh, what uh, initiate outcome will result in that. So what um, can we change uh, and in which which time frame? Can we change something next month, next year? Does it take decades for the plastic uh, reduction in the oceans? And uh, our overall arching is climate change. So um, we still need to deal with the individual factors like acidification uh, and, and so on and so on. Uh, but we need to include more, more merge all these in, into a holistic view. And uh, this had been mentioned a couple of times now. Uh, it's still true. So we uh, need a view uh, including all these visions and then see which factors are most pressing, uh, which we can change by ourselves. So deal with what we can deal with, but uh, have the holistic view overall. Hope this answers at least a part of this issue. Thank you. And there's a reaction. Thank you, Bukaren. There's a reaction to Pak Thomas. Mungkin, uh, maybe Bulasmi, would you like to open your mic? Just to say what he already wrote in the chat. So it's more lively. Okay, I'm, like... I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I cannot use my video because uh, it's, it's very uh, uh, heavy raining in here and the connection is not good. Well, um, thank you, Pak, for your answers. I share the spirit of the adjust minority, but nevertheless, the minority with majority of power. And for us, the other 99%, should we, do you think that we should uh, satisfy that the capitalism with more human face or more humane capitalism as such, or should we do something more <laughs> about it? What do you think? Where can we stop or where can we start well, well, I think from a historical perspective, um, there, there are two ways and they're both kind of happening at the moment, you know, two options. And one is, you know, you see the, the rise of populism around the, the world. You, you get this sort of revolutionary kind of moment yeah, where people, the 99% have had enough, okay? They feel that they have, their livelihoods are at stake you look, uh, you look at the, the proportion of uh, all the profits that are made uh, um, that goes to labor. And you look at it in the Western world, for example, it's been stagnant or declining uh, steadily for decades now, since about 1980. So it, the 99% get less and, and the 1% the get more and more. That's why I was trying to Put that in the mix you might have wondered early why why did i do that it's because it's so central yeah, and that there is a change and the other pathway is for uh, you know the elite itself the one percent if they uh, realize that there is a problem if they continue in this way they might change on their own account there's some there's that is also happening 
I think there's a wake up call. Phenomena such as Trump have shown other elites that if they don't share, if they don't take responsibility for their actions, whether it's towards society or the environment, uh, there is, you know, it will in the end destroy them as well. And they know they cannot escape to Mars. It's not an option, it's a fantasy. There is no escape. They must ha think more in terms of the system, more, you know, which is a, an ethical way of thinking. Uh, there is no other way, there is really no choice. So I think it will happen one way or another, it must. Thank you, kita thank you. <laughs> Baik, kita lanjut dari Parilus. Parilus, would you like to say directly about the Weber or shall I read it? Pa, Parilus, are you still there? <laughs> Still here. I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. You would, would you like me to read, or you would like to uh, say the yourself concerning um, Weber's argument? Silahkan. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Kalau saya bahasa Indonesia, Pak Thomas, bisa nggak ya? Well, basically ini yang saya mau katakan ke Pak Thomas. Yeah. Uh, if, we, if we follow the <laughs> Weber's argument about modernity, uh, which is char characterized by uh, rationalization, which actually it's an instrumental means and rationality, what he means. And this is the characteristic of the modern world. And he said uh, this modern world is uh, lose its ability to to believe in uh, uncalculable mystical power, sort of like that. So it caused a uh, disenchanted of the world like that. Uh, so if that's the trajectory of the world, according to uh, Weber, uh, how can we turn the clock back to this kind of uh, belief in uh, mystical, uncalculable uh, power while people are getting uh, rationalized, ra rationalized uh, more and more? I mean, in, instrumental rationalization. That's basically what I want to hear from you, uh, comments on that. Makasih. I, I, um, I think science is heading that way anyway, because science is discovering so much complexity that the old fashioned reductionist rationalizing perspective, it doesn't work anymore. Okay, It just does not describe the reality of what is out there. Okay, And um, in, in a way, um, I think there is a sort of a, a realization that you, you cannot you cannot just reduce things to that level. It, it's not really that isn't really science. So it, it's just a uh, you know if if you think of Bateson for example, Gregory Bateson, he uh, he. Uh, 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 cautioned us to not confuse the territory with a map. So if you if you if you have a, a mental map of something and everything we do with our mind is a, a kind of a mapping, it's a simplified version of reality. So you make a map of a landscape, it's not the landscape itself, it's not the territory. Okay, the map is a simplification, and we must remember that. It's a powerful tool to have a good map. It makes you understand the most important things, but it's not the thing itself. You know, the thing itself is, you know, like Immanuel Kant said, it's it's beyond us to grasp the thing in itself, because the information contained in in a grain of sand, for example, is so immense. Yeah, to describe that, all the supercomputers on the planet wouldn't suffice if you wanted to describe it, the, the, you know, the quantum states of all the subatomic articles in that, it's impossible to map that. It, it's never going to happen because in that way, the universe is its own map, its own perfect map. And our maps, our mental maps are only a simplification. They are an instrument. And the problem starts when you forget that it's just an instrument. Yeah. <laughs> now, we are 
uh, moving toward the end of our very rich discussion, very much engaged discussions, I would like to ask our presenters one by one to share your deep reflections, such as closing statements. What have we learned together so far, <laughs> starting, after, uh, starting from after lunch until now? May I ask first from Ibu Miki, silahkan Ibu Miki. What is your reflection? What is a closing statement? Silahkan, Bu Miki. Okay, sorry, because there's a lot of going on outside my house, so I don't really hear that you're calling my name. Uh, but, but thank you. This is uh, actually, uh, I think uh, this, this meeting and discussion is really uh, enlightening uh, in terms of, uh, I think, Transdisciplinary is something that is, if we say in the past 10, 10 years, it's not really new, but it's kind of like not many people uh, already embrace it. And I think uh, the way that we discuss uh, is really, really make me as a, as a you know, biologist uh, really think that this is really important that we, we still, uh, we need uh, to, to go forward uh, and I think uh, a lot of discussion is really embracing the need uh, to not only include uh, academics but also include uh, local knowledge, local people uh, to make sure that uh, we are able to uh, to do more uh, in the future. I think that's uh, from my side. Thank you, Ibu Yulia. Thank you, Bumiki. Next, silahkan, uh, Pak Chris. Um, Pak Chris, yes, silahkan. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, to you all, uh, and especially to uh, CTSS. Uh, thank you for um, helping uh, me along this journey to realize the importance of something which is dear to me, and that is institutions, good institutions, inclusive institutions and uh, the importance of what CTSS is trying to do uh, is, is, is never more important. And, and so I, I want to leave you all uh, with this suggestion. I mean, honestly, when I first saw, sorry, Ibu Dami, when I first saw your institute, I thought, yeah, okay, sounds nice. But uh, I, I believe in it and I believe it's important. And uh, transdisciplinarity, if you'll excuse the expression, is not new, but uh, it, it needs to have a, a, a structure to it to, to be realized. And of course, you're not a single fighter, CTSS, but nonetheless, um, I think it's really exciting what you're trying to do, what we're trying to do here, uh, that this is part of a journey. And uh, I wish you well in continuing it. And I think it's really important to, to make the most uh, of everything that everybody had to say uh, today. Uh, I thank you also for the opportunity to listen uh, to those who I was fortunate enough to listen to today. So um, my, my final uh, word is uh, looking forward to Istakos uh, 3, uh, which will be a bit different because uh, I know that uh, Damu is taking lots of notes. So I look forward to the way in which you're going to design the next symposium like this one. Thank you. Terima kasih. Next, silahkan Ibu Karen. Yeah, thank you uh, for the invitation, for the moderation, and uh, also for the opportunity to, to join this event. So I uh, agree. I also did not quite uh, knew at the beginning what to expect, uh, but... Um, this had been a very fruitful meeting and uh, enlightening discussion. So um, I would like to, to go uh, with the others. This is not the beginning, uh, that this is uh, not the end, but it's, it's the beginning, the other way around. So uh, I'm looking forward to, um, to future discussions and what we have to do, I think, and what everybody's trying to do to fill uh, this perception of uh, transdisciplinarity with life. It's, uh, it's not just a word, it should mean something and can mean different things to all of us. And uh, one, it 
addition I have to make, uh, speaking of education, uh, education is not just schools. Uh, education is uh, a lot of different activities we can engage in. And this is also part of uh, the way transdisciplinarity should, should work. Uh, on, on the way of moving things forward from uh, research, uh, including local perspectives and politics and so on, uh, we should um, um, take education uh, on the way with us and educate people on the way uh, how we develop um, together. So thanks again. I'm looking forward to the next event. Thank you, Bukaren. Thank you, Bukaren. Silakan, Pak Thomas. Next, Pak Thomas. Okay, well, I'll go back to what I said early in my talk that, you know, in nature and in society, uh, competition exists and it, it tries, the, the answer is diversification. And we have the same in, in the ac uh, academic world where, you know, you have competing um, narratives about uh, the, the truth, yeah, and you have a diversification of disciplines that has happened that keeps going, you know. So in a way, it's a very rich, diverse ecosystem. But we also need to cooperate as a system, you know, you have to have the systemic part, yeah, and the, the interaction, the mutual interdependence. And we have to realize that we depend on each other and we all have unique contributions to make and we need to respect each other and work together very closely and come out of our disciplinary silos. And like Chris said before, also bring in people from other sectors and their knowledge. And I think uh, if we can make a contribution in that direction, then this meeting was important and changed something in the world. And I hope that we can do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we all agree that we have like really strong collective determinations would like to do something to act not only to share knowledge but also what we would like to share also our knowledge and understanding with the wider audience and do something collectively. Uh, I would uh, allow also Budami, silahkan. Budami, could you please share your reflections and also your closing statement? Silahkan, okay. Bu. <laughs> Terima kasih, Ibu Yulia. Uh, okay, what can I say? Oh my God. <laughs> um, overwhelmed, I think the word is. Um, we started to develop the ideas on the theme of this um, symposium and wondered whether it will be too challenging and whether it will be too difficult to find the right people to start the discussion. And, um, but today, hey, it has been proven that it works. You are all wonderful, 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 wonderful. It's, I'm very inspired and um, I feel very alive now. Um, and I would like to quote this, um, a part of a poem from David Frost. East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. Well, I think that's wrong. <laughs> Here I can really see how East and West actually meets in transdisciplinarity, okay? And um, I really would like to thank all of you that um, I, we, we, today, I think what we have learned together is that life is like a pendulum. We learn a lot about local knowledge. Well, transdisciplinary, as has been said by Thomas and also Bumiki, it's not a new thing. You know, it's, it's already there because local knowledge is actually in, in transdisciplinarity. So it was there in the Eastern way of thinking and then the enlightenment, modern science came in and science developed so fast. So the pendulum turns over back to the right side. And now looking back, it's like, oh, okay. Did we do something wrong there? Because we forgot the sacredness. The sacredness is gone. Okay, now maybe we should look back. So 
I think what we are um, experiencing is that at least I'm, I'm looking at like, okay, we're going that way, this way, and now back there. So um, maybe this all means that it's time for us to, as Watam suggests, collaborate, embrace each other, find that humility back. Um, science, which actually hopes that one can find humility in science, is actually now going to the different direction. It seems that people are now have this power and wealth and then very, very, um, very proud that their um, citation rate is so-and-so and their uh, publication is in the Q1 and their Scopus index in, you know, whatever. So everything goes down into small numbers of measures, you know, but not really the, the essence of what this education is. So I think I would like to close with my late father. He said, the objective of education is three. The first objective of education is to make a living. The second objective of education is to lead a meaningful life. The third objective of education is to ennoble life. And where do we want this education to go? Do we just want it to be objective one or do we want to ennoble life? What type of education that we should develop in the future so that we can ennoble life? So with that, Thank you. And we will definitely follow this up. I'm not going to let you rest. Let me think. And I'm going to write an email and let's think about the future together. Thank you so much. And thank you, you Leo, for a wonderful. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you all of the. Oh, thank you for all of the wonderful panelists. I've learned so much from everybody. Terima kasih banyak because we have been uh, discussing for some times now <laughs> and everybody seems like really still patiently engaged in the discussions. Thank you so much. Terima kasih banyak. Until the next time. Uh, are we going to take some photo or already take some photo? Oh yeah, let's, let's take some picture. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's what, like, that's I'm what sorry. Indonesians do. Because I'm like, okay. I'm Indonesian. <laughs> I always ask for photos. Indonesians do that. Okay, so let's take the picture. Let's take photos. Okay. Would you like to take some okay. pictures? Okay. Yes, uh, yes, please. If it's the administrator, all, you can do that. Yeah. Can the participants also? Can you also take the participants' yes. picture? Yes, yes, please. Okay. okay. Will everybody... be taking pictures? Yes, Thank we. You, yeah. Please smile to the camera, if you may. Okay, in three, two, one. Once Thank again, you. yeah, once again in three, two, one. Thank you. Thank you okay, also thank for you. all of the thank you oh. for also for all of the participants who are still here. Of oh, oh, so oh, yeah, yeah, hours. Okay, can, can I ask I want to ask the dean? Is the dean still here? But Anas, are you still here? Anas is the dean of graduate school. Okay, Pa Anas, would you like to say a closing statement, Pa Anas? Silakan, silakan. Pa Anas is our dean. Closing statement from Pa Anas. Okay, I just would like to say thank you, Budami. I follow all of the the presentation. It's quite an inspiring. Uh, presentation and I think uh, I just would like to quote one thing one word so so I think that that uh, I think uh, yeah. CTSS, could you please administrator to mute your mic please sorry sorry pa okay please continue pa yeah, just would like to say thank you to all of the uh, speaker and the committee, especially to uh, Bu Dami. Sorry, I, I, I tried to open my uh, video because I'm now at home. <laughs> so it's in the kitchen now. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> just would like to say thank you to Bu Dami and all the team and all the, all the speakers.
uh, I think we really uh, got a lot of uh, very important yeah, information and also some of the knowledge that quite challenging, yeah, Budami, yeah, uh, especially on how to to develop the methodology for research, yeah, uh, transdisciplinary research methodology. I think that's something that we need to to find uh, a way for. Um, then uh, introducing it to the student, and the student start to do not quantitative, all of the quantitative, but the combination between quantitative and qualitative uh, research to explore more on the complexity and also transdisciplinary uh, sciences. So again, I would like to thanks to all of uh, you. Uh, so hope that this network can be uh, sustained uh, for the uh, our collaboration in the future. Again, just would like to, to uh, say again one uh, quote, as I mentioned before, <coughs> saying, ngerti ora iso, yeah? saying iso ora kuoso, saying kuoso ora ngerti. So this is the cycle that we need to break it up, so then become saying kuoso, ngerti, dan iso, yeah? so then everything can be solved. So again, thank you very much. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam, Pak. Lovely. There's a lot of very deep quote today. Poem quotes. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Mendalam sekali, Pak. Selamat sore semuanya. Selamat and enjoy sore. the rest of the week. Thank you so bye, much bye. for sharing. And thank bye. you so much for listening. Bye. bye, -bye. Until next time. Until next time. Terima bye -bye. kasih. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Ada pembagian sertifikat. Ya, silakan. Bagi panitia dan bagi peserta yang masih mau pengumuman, silahkan. Yang lain mungkin bisa live ya. Oke, okay. thank you Dr. Yulia Sugandi for leading the third plenary session. Also, thank you Profesor Anas for the closing statement. We would also like to thank our honorable speakers for the very interesting uh, session. I think some of the panelists asked for a follow-up discussion after this event because it was very thoughtful and eye-opening discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, this marks the end of the plenary session and we would like to present the token of appreciation to our honorable speakers, keynote speaker and moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to present a certificate of appreciation to the speakers of the third plenary session. The first one uh, awarded to Dr. Mirza Kusrini from IPB University. The second is to Professor Christopher Bennett from Faculty of Land and Food System of the University of British Columbia. The third uh, is presented to Dr. Karen von Uterjenka from IPB University. And to the honorable keynote speaker, Professor Thomas Ruther from the Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne. And to the moderator of the third plenary session, Dr. Yulia Sugandi. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are reaching the end of the second International Symposium on Transdisciplinarity and Approach for Knowledge Co-Creation in Sustainability 2020. Before we end this event, we would like to remind the participants that tomorrow on the 4th of November 2020, we will have a seminar that you may attend if you have registered before, starting from 9 a.m. in local Indonesian time via Zoom meeting. Further information regarding to the seminar will be shared later on by the committee. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the organizing committee, Center for Transdisciplinary and Sustainability Sciences and IPB University, we would like to express our greatest appreciation to distinguished guests, honorable speakers and participants for joining our event. We fully acknowledge your participation and support for the second ISTACOS 2020. We hope that the shared information will be beneficial for all of us. We would also like to take this opportunity to spread our message regarding the, to the current world situation. 
please follow the safety guidelines according to the government and wear masks if you are intended to go outside. At last, please stay safe and healthy, and we hope to see you again on the next occasion. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.